Hello. Great. Thank you very much, John. Um, we're just seeing the participants slowly coming through. So before I start my official welcome, um, if those of you who are joining can just make sure that you are muted. Um, you're welcome to have your cameras on or off. Um, if you are struggling with Wi-Fi broadband, you might be better to have your cameras off. Um, but we are up to about 50 participants at the moment and we had uh, well over 100 signed up. So I'm just going to give it until four minutes past and then I'll get started. Okay, great. It's four minutes past on my laptop, so I will get started. Um, welcome everyone to our spring conference. Um, it's really nice to see as participants coming through. Quite a lot of new names as well as familiar names um, scattered right across the country as well. So that's fantastic. So welcome very much and thank you for attending. If you don't know me, I'm Emma Bridge, Chief Executive of Community Energy England. I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes to take you through the admin instructions, the format for the day before I hand over to the chair of the event, which is Philip Coventry. In case um, any of those new names uh, have just signed up off spec and actually haven't come across us before and don't know what we do, um, Community Energy England was established nearly seven years ago now by a group of community energy practitioners to provide a voice for community energy. We work with our 270 plus member organisations to support the development of a thriving community sector that is both integrated into and is powering a fair zero carbon energy system. Our activities related to this are focused around policy and advocacy, sharing learning, um, creating connections and working to remove obstacles for community energy groups and projects. We would be nothing without our members, so thank you in particular to those of you who are members dialing in today as well. So it was almost a year ago to the day that we held our first ever online conference, which was our first spring conference with Community Energy South last year, which was a mammoth, full day, very stressful and exciting event. I think since then, over the last year, we've all got quite used to, stroke sick of, or quite enjoying um, the move to online events. I know that I'm missing catching up with a lot of you over coffee or the train station platform. Um, but I think there have been positives for most of being online um, in terms of the breadth of people that we've been managing to engage with over the last year has been fantastic. And we've learned a lot over last year on how to run events and make sure that they are interactive. And that's very much the aim of today's event as well. So in terms of the admin instructions for today, they're all fairly straightforward. We are recording the event, so the recording will go onto our YouTube channel, as have all of our other events over the past year. Um, we, can we can put a link in the chat box to our Zoom uh, YouTube channel if anyone is interested. Throughout the day, post questions in the chat box, um, which is the middle bottom of Zoom, you will see chat function. You may find that when people are doing presentations that it goes into full view on your screen, and then it gets that really annoying that the chat and the participant boxes are in a separate box that's, that's over your screen. So if you just go into view and come out full screen view, you'll then see it all lined up side by side. So you should be able to find it easier to watch what's happening as well as follow the chat throughout the day. We will be saving the chat. So any questions that are put in the chat function that we don't have time to address today, we will be picking up after the conference. And you might also find it useful yourself to save the chat afterwards to follow what some of the things being said. Um, so also bear in mind that when you are posting in the chat function that other people may be saving that as well. So maybe think about with that filter on when you're posting. Um, we will be uh, sharing any slides after the events. Um, and also finally, if everyone can possibly say, share their full name and their organizational group in the participant list as well, just find that's really helpful in terms of helping that open and honest dialogue. So if you don't know how to do that, if you click on participants and then find your name, which should be at the top of the list of participants, hover over it, click on more and then rename. So find your name in the participant list, click on more and then rename, and then you can put your full name and organization in there. That would be fantastic. So the format for this afternoon is slightly different to usual. We'll be starting with two discussion panels, exploring COP26 and the role of community energy. 
Usually our events do focus on presentations from our members around business models, challenges and opportunities. And we will be doing that again in future events and during Community Energy Fortnight in the summer. But we really thought that you couldn't miss the opportunity for looking, really exploring COP26 and the opportunities with it taking place in the UK this year. And also with the urgent need for climate change being more critical than ever. Um, I'll leave the panels to explore in more detail what COP is and why it's important. But essentially, a COP stands for um, Conference of the Parties, and it brings together delegates from nearly 200 countries to join together to talk over two weeks around what action they will be taking on climate change. The 2021 meeting is the 26th meeting of the Conference of Parties. So this, that's why it's called COP26, essentially. And it's taking place in Glasgow in November this year. So there's an extra opportunity there for us to really make sure that the UK shows climate leadership this year. We've already been in discussions with partners and members around how what CE's role should be in this. And we've been putting updates in our member newsletters around our activity. But I really want to use today's event to be the springboard for future CE and community energy activity around COP. So please do use the chat. Please do get engaged in the breakout session discussions. And please do feedback to us about what you're planning on doing for COP, if you're planning on doing anything, if you don't think we should be getting engaged. Please do all of these discussions really help to influence what we'll be doing over the next six to nine months. So after we've had those two discussion panels, we'll have a five minute tea break before we come back for presentations from Beth at Patagonia. So they launched two weeks ago a film all around community energy across Europe and the UK represented by Energy Garden. It's a very short 36 minute film, so I recommend that you watch it. And again, we'll put a link in the chat box so that you can see that if you haven't already. We'll then be hearing from Tom Hoynes, who has an exciting announcement. Those of you on Twitter might have already had a spoiler about this announcement earlier today. And then Chloe Uden will be talking about their fantastic Moths to a Flame art tour. We're then trialing a community energy soapbox. So we gave all delegates and members an opportunity to just stand up virtually for a minute to talk about an idea, a project, a challenge that they have. And we had two takers for that this time. So we'll be hearing about the Cheese Project and Rural Community Energy Fund. Um, we'll then be having a breakout session to have give everyone the opportunity to really discuss what's been talked about today, um, any other challenges or anything else at the forefront of your mind. We'll then come back to very, very briefly feedback on what was discussed in the breakout sessions, and then we'll be aiming to wrap up by four o'clock. So I just want to thank Co Community Energy for sponsoring the conference and for Patagonia for supporting both this event and Community Energy Fortnight. The theme for the fortnight this year, which will take place in June, is We the Power, and will be very much linked to their community energy campaign, which you'll hear, which Beth will talk about. We do have a holding page on our website, and we'll send out more details. That leads me to just say thank you very much for attending. Um, I will now hand over to Philip to take over the chairing of the event. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Emma. Um, so yeah, for those who don't know me, I'm Philip Coventry. I'm Projects and Operations Manager at Community Energy England, uh, one of the, the newer members of the team. Um, so yeah, the, the discussion that we're going to sort of launch into now is uh, talking about why COP26 is important to the community energy sector and what role should practitioners, organisations and supportive stakeholders within community energy be playing. So I'm uh, delighted that we've got three um, really knowledgeable and experienced panellists to, to discuss that with us today. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing them um, in alphabetical order. Um, they, they've each kind of uh, got an opportunity after that to give a little uh, intro to tell a little bit more about um, themselves, anything I've missed, um, and uh, tell us a little bit about why they are kind of participating today in this conversation and interested, engaged in, in COP26 preparations. So I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, so to start with, um, we have Dr. Matthew Hannon, who's a Director of Research, Senior Lecturer at the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship within the University of Strathclyde's Business School. His research examines the policy and market conditions necessary to accelerate low carbon energy technology and business model innovation. That was a mouthful, but it sounds uh, really interesting. He is co-investigator on UKRI's um, Energy Rev Consortium, um, looking at smart locally led energy systems um, He's also involved with Community Energy Finance Project. Um, he works uh, with, it, with a, a community sustainability organisation in Glasgow and 
is a host of the Local Zero Pathway to COP26 podcast, um, the latest episode of which features our very own Emma Bridge. Um, so yeah, Matthew, I'll just hand over to you now and uh, if you want to, to tell us anything about yourself and, and also talk to us a little bit about uh, why you're, you're here today, that would be great. Okay, many thanks, Philip. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, so thank you for having me along. Um, yes, yeah, so as Philip says, uh, I'm a senior lecturer at Strathclyde Business School, uh, so we're based up in Glasgow, and obviously that's uh, the place, uh, you know, in terms of the focus for today's discussion, with it being the host to uh, COP26. So my work, I guess, is, uh, falls into two areas, uh, and my interest in today. So one is about research, and the other is about sort of the, the practical uh, practitioner elements of this. So with the research, uh, the bulk of our work is looking at um, the new types of finance and business models that are emerging to fill the gap that the feed-in tariff and renewable heat incentive and their withdrawal is going to leave behind. So what do these new business models look like and how can we finance them and support them more broadly with, with policy and regs? So there's various projects which I can put links to in, in the chat here from the UK Energy Research Centre and also Energy Rev. Um, and as Philip has quite rightly pointed out, we're also host of uh, a podcast called Local Zero. Again, I'll put the, 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 the link up in here, um, where we're really trying to explore in the lead up to COP all the different challenges that are associated with tackling climate change, but looking at it from a, a local perspective. So very much at the heart of that is community energy. So that's on the kind of research side. So I'm looking at this from a, you know, a kind of academic standpoint. Uh, increasing, increasingly so, though, in, over the last couple of years, I've been much more involved in the kind of practitioner elements of this. And uh, today I'm both trustee and chair of an organization called South Seeds, and we operate across the south side of Glasgow. Uh, we're now in our 10th year. And I think like many other community energy organizations, um, many of which will be represented on the call today, uh, we're at a, a crossroads and, and a difficult juncture in our, in our uh, progression. So on the one hand, there's a real opportunity for um, community organizations to step up and play a key role in just transition. Uh, and, and net zero. And in fact, there's a, a growing gap uh, opening up at a local level from reductions in, in local authority funding and a tightening, uh, uh, you know, in a kind of almost justice position here, a tightening of targets and um, around net zero and climate emergency. So I think communities have a real opportunity, but there isn't much in the way of support to enable them to, to take hold of that. So we at South Seeds are looking at how we can diversify our revenue streams and to really put in place a long-term and resilient strategy going forward. And through my research, I know that other organizations are, are feeling the same pains. Um, so desperate to grow, huge opportunity to do so, um, but how do we do that? So, so that's my interest, Philip, for today. I'd like to talk much more about uh, diversifying revenue, strain, revenue streams, raising finance, and also asset transfers. And just a final comment before I, I let you... Um, push on to the other panelists i think it's also important to point out that i wear one more hat which is as a member of the customer engagement group for scottish power energy networks um we're looking we, we're there to critique their business plan which will be submitted to Ofgem shortly from period 23 to 28 um, and i'm leading uh, as part of that keg um, on their community energy um, work stream so seeing a lot from the perspective of the dno about how they're looking to support communities. So, Philip, I'm assuming you, you're wanting to move across into the other panelists. So, I'll pause there and keep my powder dry for, for the rest of the panel. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Matt. That was a really good introduction. Um, so, I'll now move on to Rachel Hayes, who is an associate director at Regen, where she leads their networks, development, events, marketing, and communications, and is currently seconded into the Cabinet Office, uh, working with them on preparations for COP26. Rachel founded a thriving National Women in Renewables Network. Rewire is a director of the Energy Electricity Storage Network and is a very long standing member of the Community Energy England board. So, yeah, Rachel, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Philip. And thanks, everyone, for having me today. I'm delighted to be on the panel. Um, yeah, as Philip mentioned, I'm currently, um, so I work for Regen as an associate director. Um, Regen is a not for profit centre of energy expertise and market insight. So we have a pretty big mission to transform the world's energy system for a zero carbon future. So um, Regen still paying my wages, which is good. Um, and I've been seconded into the COP unit um, as part of the Cabinet Office. 
So working in the strategy team to support, um, to ensure um, that COP is a success with a bit of a focus on how COP lands domestically in the UK. Um, myself and a couple of other secondees have rebranded ourselves the UK team. Um, and we've got a real focus, a kind of key focus on the opportunity, um, looking at jobs and skills in particular. Um, so that's really it from me. I'm not going to talk too much about myself. So I'm kind of keen to get into the discussion. Lovely. Thanks, Rachel. Um, lastly, but certainly not leastly, I'll move on to Dr. Afshin Rashid, who is a community energy specialist with over 10 years experience in the sector and a very prominent member of the sector. Afshin is chief executive at Repowering London, one of the leading community energy organisations, and sits as chair of Brixton Energy um, Solar Cooperatives, the UK's first inner city community owned solar power stations. Uh, Afshin is a former senior policy advisor at the Department of Energy and Climate Change and is the current um, chair of Community Energy England's board. Afshin remains influential in both local and national community energy decision making. She's also a trustee of Friends of the Earth and an advisor to numerous other organisations. Over to you, Afshin. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, maybe I should just give a bit of introduction about repowering. Um, we specialise in community energy projects. We're focused in London. Uh, as Philip's mentioned, our first first scheme um, has uh, grown out of uh, Brixton and the context within Brixton. So we're very much about uh, not just the, the energy in its kind of electrical form, but also in the people form and uh, really bringing uh, diverse communities and people who wouldn't have other been, otherwise been engaged in this uh, space. And, and uh, yeah, it's been really, really a whole journey of growing from working in Brixton to now working in other parts of, of London. So really uh, acting as a catalyst or enabler for other community energy groups to copy that model and see more of that happen across London. We are um, interested in talking to Matthew, actually, you know, you were talking about the innovation space and we're doing quite a lot around um, not just being classified as energy generators, but also looking at innovation, looking how we can supply electricity, how we can create that local energy service model, that dream <laughs> model and business uh, business plans and uh, post fit and uh, in a yeah complex, very challenging um, dynamic sector. And so that's a little bit about repowering. And uh, why am I here today? Um, why am I taking part in this conversation? I must admit that um, I've always felt uh, the COP26 process very much top down uh, and a bit far removed. Uh, I think this is a good opportunity that's happening in the UK and we're here and we can participate uh, and be present um, and we'll, we'll see how, what that looks like if it's online or in person. But I, I yeah, have been a bit, um, I am a bit um, cynical about it, but uh, I do recognize the opportunities and the importance and, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm generally very positive by nature. So yeah, there's definitely something to for us to to uh, make out of this opportunity. And, and I'm sure that, you know, I will beat the cynic out of, <laughs> out of my head. Um, but I think collectively as well, this is important for us to have this conversation uh, so that, you know, there is a sound strategy for how, how we can make the best out of this opportunity. And I'm really keen to hear what others have to say as well. Um, yeah, because it's, it's something I feel uh, that will be quite quite important and big for us, and so we really need to, uh, you know, really shout out and throw a spotlight on community energy and our work. And how do we do that? I'm not quite clear. So uh, yeah, great to be here today and find out. Thanks, Ashin. So that's a good introduction to some of the views and perspectives of the participants. I think um, Rachel having having kind of. Uh, kept her card slightly close to her chest. I'm going to go to you first. Um, so actually you talked there a bit about the, the kind of top-down nature of the process. Matthew was talking about the, uh, the, the challenges that, that, that community organisations might face um, at this particular point in time. So kind of responding to that, what's your perspective on COP as an opportunity or a challenge for the sector? How, how do you see it from um, your position within Regen, but also what, what you've learned now from being involved in the government side? Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so I think, so for me, COP26 um, takes place in Glasgow this November. It's a real critical moment for addressing the global climate crisis. I think Paris delivered a promise that the world would act on climate change. Um, and I think we've got an opportunity now in Glasgow to show that this action is a reality. Um, 
we're in a position, I guess, from after last week, where all G7 countries responsible for almost half of global GDP have committed to deep cuts in their emissions over the next decade, aligning with their net zero commitments. So I think we're a significant step forward um, to keeping um, 1.5 degrees within reach from a group of countries who've had a real responsibility to lead, but I don't think we're anywhere near enough. Um, I think that I'm in a very fortunate position now working within government for the first time. And um, I want to use that opportunity to kind of harness the collective power from the clean energy sector to really drive that ambition. So for me, COP is very much about making the link between the work I do and have done at Regen um, and supporting CEE for the last 10 years um, with what often, I kind of agree with Afshin, what feels like a kind of unsurmountable global climate crisis that we're all facing. Um, so for me, I guess, in terms of that kind of scene setting, um, we know that the next decade will make or break for planet Earth. And I'm not sure anything is really more important. So I feel like anything that we can do to kind of contribute to the success of that is, is vital. Thanks. Um, Matthew, sort of res responds to that, you, you were talking about your, your view from the community organisation and, and the challenges of the business model. Do, do you see that that is maybe more prominent as a, as a challenge opportunity for you and, and, and is COP therefore quite distant when you're you're seeing it from that ground level perspective or do you do you share the view of, of COP as a potential way to really uh, kind of in, enhance the, 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 the prominence and pressure of the movement? I think from the, the community standpoint um, the value is is on two different levels so, so firstly um, so and I'm going to ignore the global element here, which is obviously the elephant in the room, and we can talk about that a bit more. But nationally, um, there's a lot of ambition, relatively little action to point to, to back that up. And where there is action, it isn't joined up. So we have situations emerging just in the last couple of months where governments made the bold stand on banning internal combustion engines by 2030. Yet at the, in the same breath, they're freezing fuel duty for the 10th year. They're looking to ensure that 13 million homes uh, reach at least EPC band, Energy Performance Certificate Band C, by 2035. Yet now it looks like the Green Homes Grant is, has, has now been cancelled. So we have this lack of joined up thinking. Uh, that there, there's a long term vision with relatively little short term joined up um, uh, action to back that up. And, and the other element to this is... I think with COP, it offers a pressure for UK government and the devolved administrations to think joined up, but not just for net zero, for a just transition and mm -hmm. to bring that third element in there, which isn't just the environmental benefit nor the economic benefit, but the social benefit. So I think COP offers a real opportunity for communities at that national level to apply pressure. But at the local level, I see this playing a different role. Um, and I, I really think here we're looking much more at um, a, a cultural legacy. So I think back, so living in Glasgow, I've been here for the last three or four years, um, people still talk about when Glasgow was uh, the European city of culture in 1990, and even fresher in people's minds, uh, the Commonwealth Games in 2014. And I'm a true believer in events like these and others in London with 2012 Olympics of bringing people in who were not normally part of the conversation before and making them think about things that they may have otherwise ignored. So I think putting in place that longer term legacy about environmental action in the context of a just transition is critical and communities can do that by leading on a COP fringe. And I'll finish on this, even if COP is canceled, which is very, very possible, uh, I say canceled, possibly delayed, I still think there's a real value in community organizations taking the lead during those two weeks in November and putting in place a roster of events for a net zero or just transition fortnight that bring these people into these cultural activities and put in place that, that legacy that will hopefully push us closer towards net zero. Mm. Yeah, go ahead, Afshin. Yeah, just uh, Matt's, uh, Matthew's just kind of thrown off a few things for me, thoughts for me. Um, community, you know, last year through the whole um, coronavirus crisis, we've, we've uh, as community energy organisations, have really stepped uh, up and stepped into a space where there's been massive failures uh, and a lot of people have suffered from system failures being housing disrepair to energy suppliers not really meeting the needs of their vulnerable customers and we community energy organizations have uh, really um, provided that support, pulled together our resources, um, funds, you know, uh, expertise 
uh, and really created a um, and developed a very hyper local kind of response. And I think there's so much for us to shout out about as a as a sector. And you know, you were talking about the the climate justice, and often we think about you know climate justice and the movement. Uh, in the context of, you know, the, the global south and the north and that divide, but actually there are people very much here in the UK who are uh, who are suffering and, and the last year has really also shown the inequalities and the impact on, on people's lives. And, and to me, what's come through last year has been the real strength of community and the real strength of community energy organisations. And I'm just wondering, you know, there is there is something for us to celebrate in terms of our role, but celebrate and shout out about what we've done in our approach, but also just show how essential it is uh, if we want to have a, you know, a, a, a just uh, transition, um, you know, and a net zero transition that doesn't leave people behind, um, that our role is so important and unique. And um, what my frustration is that we've been saying this and we've been, you know, we, government recognizes and you know they, there's always this yes you know we, we, we recognize people are important and we need to bring people with us through behavior change but we're not seeing what is frustrating is that we don't see the policy um that backs that and to me that's that's really frustrating and and how do we make sure that this you know even if we were to run a fringe event you know in a cop uh you know even if it didn't happen and if we did something in november then how do we make sure that it's meaningful and that that is heard and that that we are it translates into policy into into action into a document you know so i really feel like that's our aim that should be our aim if we were to invest into holding events and actively getting uh, participating in this we need to have some clear asks and uh, our aim should be that there is more support and yeah we're not taking lip service anymore Thanks, Ashley. And Rachel, do you feel able to respond to that? Also, I wonder if I could prompt you to kind of also talk about the potential, the role that you see for CEE within what Ashley's talking about, but how the sector does put pressure on the government. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think, so I definitely think see that as a bit of a two pronged approach. So firstly, I think we want to celebrate local action across the UK. We want to show that climate change is a shared problem, which everyone needs to play their part in addressing. I see our role is to showcase the great organisations, pioneering projects, inspiring people, all working to kind of in community energy projects who are tackling the climate crisis across the UK like um, and, and really showcasing the vibrant community energy sector that we have. Um, I also think that the sector, I think it's got something like 96,000 members. All of those members are passionate about seeing change plugged into their local communities. We want to harness that collective power, bring more people on board um, to be receptive to the behaviour change that we need to achieve our ambitious goals. So, you know, we've seen some positives out of the last 12 months, if I can draw on those with less cars on the road, less planes in the air. So we know that behaviour change is possible. Um, you know, I want to, you know, I'd like to see some kind of festivals and local action. I'm thinking of organising a festival at our local wind farm site, um, like a yeah, climate festival, engaging the school children, local people, a chance to kind of get together, have some music, do some fun things, the leftover food, etc. So really keen to kind of see that that movement and that success and that kind of bringing everyone together so that it is seen as a really positive but um I agree with Ashin's point and I think I've I guess I'm much more aware of the international picture that the COP unit have as a focus mm. um and how domestic policy is being led by the regular departments that it's always been led by um so yeah there, there is I think there is a I agree there's a lot of work to do to to get policy across the whole of government aligned with our net zero ambitions and aligned with the the behavior change that we that we need to see in the future um and I, I yeah I think that's really important and something I'm hoping this is a comment I'm in the very early days I'm hoping that will give me an opportunity to engage in some of those um those conversations and you know have sight of things before they they're out kind of in the mainstream um certainly um so yeah so I think you know, I think we, as a sector, we really need to get behind COP and showcase how brilliant community energy is and, and that local action on the ground. And I think um, as part of that, then there's a, that kind of that second prong, I guess, is using that strength and that that vibrancy to, to influence policy and to, to to use the people plugged in in their local areas to really um, 
to demonstrate back to government the importance of community energy and the role that it can play in a just transition um, in delivering those messages. You know, the, the behaviour change, there's going to be a huge behaviour change programme coming after COP. Um, and I think community energy has got a great role to, to play in that. Philip, could I just follow up on that last point? Because that, that's that's really critical from Rachel. But this the net zero transition is a game of two halves. Um, I use this terrible analogy because I'm a, I'm a football fanatic. So, um, you know, we, we're getting up to the 50% kind of emissions reduction versus 1990. That's that's where we're at. The next half is going to be a lot harder. This is going to involve every home, every person making tough decisions about changing their lifestyle, whether that's how they heat their home, eat the food, how they travel from A to B. Um, to do that... I really think UK government, and again, I'd welcome Rachel's view on this. I don't think UK government or the devolved administrations have really woken up to the value of community energy as a, as a tool to unlock this behavioural change for two key reasons. One, people like control and community energy can give them that. The, I think everybody, but probably particularly the Brits, uh, push against and rail against that control of their lifestyles. And we've seen that to some extent with COVID. And I also think there needs to be a sweetener at the end of this, something to, to sugar the, the bitter pill of, of wrenching our lifestyles from one to another. And I think we can frame that with the community benefit and the tangible changes that the community um, schemes can offer their local neighborhoods. And so I think if we can offer control and we can offer clear and um, demonstrable social benefit, I think, honestly, I think community energy can help us deliver a just transition. Um, and without it, the question is, can we do it? Uh, so to, to, to summarise that, it's not, it's, I think thus far, the first half has been around, I think people have seen it as a problem for the state and for big business. Now it's really about the citizens have got to enter the game now. And I think community energy is the, the hook for that. Mm -hmm. Afshin, what, what, do, what do you see as, you know, you're, you're, you're very deeply in, rooted in community energy and communities. Um, do, do you see that, that from your perspective, the communities are, are ready to engage with organisations like Repowering to, to bring about that kind of behaviour change and then demonstrate that to, go, demonstrate that to government? Um, absolutely. I think we're, we're playing our part. We're, we're uh, you know, and not just repairing, I'm sure many organizations and attendees here today will, will know just from uh, last year's experience how um, the commitment from people uh, is huge. We've seen a huge surge in terms of our volunteers uh, over last year. And we were like, oh gosh, now how do we, how do we keep them engaged and retained when we're not actually going out to events and we're, you know, fundraising differently. Uh, but but actually there's there's been this huge momentum and. And, and people really want to see change. The local context has become really important as well to people as, as uh, you, you're more connected in your local area because you're, you're not traveling to work or traveling away. Uh, you're kind of noticing that local context a bit more. You maybe have people have got more time to give um, and they've, they've sought out their local projects and their investment in the local community. So I think there is this huge appetite and we've seen a surge of that over last year. We were actually worried. We thought, oh gosh, um, you know, when COVID hit, we were like, how, how will we fundraise? Because, you know, this is going to hurt people's pockets and are people going to be willing to invest in schemes? And, and to the contrary, we've seen people willing to also invest. And, and I'm sure others have also seen some successful uh, fundraisers happen. So um, community energy definitely has the power to bring more people uh, uh, into this space. Maybe there's a bit more work for us to be done to engage new audiences and, and think maybe differently in our marketing strategy, so how we can bring new audiences. Uh, but I think the potential is there. I firmly believe that, you know, <laughs> we are essential <laughs> to the answers needed uh, to get to net zero. I think the question is, how do we um, put the business case forward for government and policymakers and decision makers to pay attention and to take us seriously? Because they often look at us and say, oh, you know, your niche, you're not going to solve, uh, you know, the, car, the, the gap in the uh, renewables market or, uh, you know, the surge, you know, in terms of energy energy generation, they'll invest in, you know, off uh, windshore farms, um, government policy, you know, I know they've just on Earth Day, the announcement made around, um, you know, the ambition for 78% uh, by 2035, you know, that's really great, but how we need to make sure that those policies 
uh, that underpin those targets also about decentralized um, localized energy not just um, you know nuclear more nuclear or uh, carbon capture storage and other uh, other policy so what is the policy behind that and um, how do we make sure that that local uh, and that decentralized decarbonized and the democratized uh, energy system that community energy are so essential uh, for uh, happens and uh, yeah I think what we've seen is over the last few years, huge removal of support for community energy in terms of the fair or other subsidies, you know, planning consent. So there's been huge barriers, but in spite of all of that, a lot of organizations are still delivering projects. Uh, and there's been a shift from not just renewable energy technologies to uh, service provisions around energy advice to uh, retrofits to um, you know looking at innovation projects and communities coming together around EV charging uh, you know sustainable transport so there's, there's just so much happening and I suppose our challenge is about really um, communicating that in a really succinct uh, and um, uh, succinct but also a really strong way that aligns with what government's got plans for for me, I think the strength for community energy and probably our targeting our messaging is around those jobs, the just transition, you know, creating uh, resilience in local communities and um, yeah, bringing people, bringing people with us along this journey. So I, I definitely see uh, what our strengths are and I think we just need to get better at uh, presenting and packaging our impact uh, and our value back to government. Um, so that they pay attention. Oh, can I come in there, Philip? Yeah, please do. Cool. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, I, I guess panel discussions are often aren't as much fun if everyone agrees, but I guess we're all <laughs> I'm kind of yeah, preaching to the converted, aren't we, in many ways. But I think community energy does have the real potential to bridge the gap between the huge groundswell and desire of regular people like you and I who are frustrated by inaction and we who want to take action on climate change beyond the green tariff, how they heat their home, the car they drive. And I think we have an opportunity to bring about a mass movement of change that enables roots for people to participate. Um, I do think that um, we need to kind of ramp up um, community energy. I think that we need to deliver big projects at scale owned by the people that use that power and raise awareness and engage communities on issues surrounding climate change around energy efficiency. I think in my month so far as part of COP, it's really taught me the sheer scale needed, the talk of the gigaton gap, um, the need for every country to raise their ambition far higher than where we are. Um, which is far better than where we were kind of the previous week after last week's announcements, but it's still nowhere near enough. Um, so I think really building on the role that communities play as trusted intermediaries, working with DNOs, local authorities, corporates, um, as those people on the ground who really understand the local environment. And I think that has adds huge amount of value in getting things done, getting people engaged and on board. I think, you know, we're definitely going to see huge job announcements and engagement around CCUS, around, you know, green hydrogen, um, around offshore wind, um, you know the, the the sheer scale of things that need to be delivered in order to get anywhere near where we need to get to it all needs to happen um but i think the i, th I feel like the niche that community energy can really play is in bringing society or bringing regular people into the fold so that they can they can do something more than they can individually and i feel that's the the bridge that community energy can make is between kind of real people community energy and then community energy engaging with those key national big players and stakeholders um, in a really effective way and I think if we get better as a sector much more joined up much more ambitious in terms of scale and delivery to and, and feed that back to government I think that that will help um, but you know and I think there's always some more to be done you know someone said to me recently oh it's great that someone you know in government now who understands what community energy is like <laughs> that's a first step so kind of me being in the door I guess educating people on what community energy is and what it can deliver and um, as, as yeah might go some way towards solving solving that problem um, but yeah I think there's, there's a definite a definite case to, to to be more ambitious and to think about scale and um and to, to leverage that local on the ground knowledge. Philip, could I, could I please just quickly follow up? I, I also see Baroness Bennett has got a hand up, so I don't, I don't want to eat into the Q&A time. Just a very quick point on local authorities, because I think this is an interesting point for discussion, hopefully. 
where do community organizations stand in terms of partnership with local authorities? On the one hand, we now have three quarters of local authorities have declared climate emergencies, yet they're chronically underfunded. We've seen uh, local authority uh, funding cut since 2010, according to the IFG, by 21% in England, between 7 and 8% in, in Scotland and Wales. So they've got a massive target to deliver on. Uh, they don't have the cash. Um, now, does that mean that they're in a good position to, uh, to connect with count, uh, community organisations and use them as a means of delivering some of these, these difficult targets? Or are actually they, they so underfunded, they simply don't have the resource to, to connect and build those partnerships? So I, I, yeah, I'd really value hearing people's comments on that, because I think that is the big, big question for communities going forward and indeed councils. Thank you. It was slightly, slightly unplanned, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give the floor to you today, Natalie Benno, since uh, you were one of the other panelists, you've got your hand up if you'd like to come in. Thank you very much. And it was great to be with everyone and apologies that I had an emergency I needed to deal with before. Um, I've been really impressed and enjoying the, the energy, no pun intended, and enthusiasm that I've been hearing since I've been on the call. Um, and what I've been reflecting in terms of what I can add partly comes out of the fact that I've just uh, an hour or so ago was in the house talking about the financial sector which since we've been through a whole series of financial bills right lately is seems to be occupying a lot of my time and I think there's really a story to be told and a story to be sold in government one of the huge problems we have is there's a huge amount of cash sloshing around the world at the moment looking for somewhere safe decent and reliable to go and you know I've just been talking about how bitcoin um uh, producing bitcoin uses as much energy as the entire of, uh, entirety of the nation of Norway and Selling the idea of community energy as a basis of prosperous local societies, local communities, and that you know, people, although there's so much poverty and inequality, there are also in many communities, lots of people who are, who are really looking for something to do with their money. And this is a way to keep the money in the local community and get the money circulating in the local community. And in terms of the government and COP, I think, you know, sadly, the practical reality is, and I was with a... Um, with Mary Robinson, the um, chair of the leaders, former Irish president, he was really using me and I've been running around trying to deliver it ever since to try and deliver a message to the government saying they really need to build up their moral authority to be chair of COP. And something like you know, supporting community energy is a great way to do that. And I, I was having a meeting on Friday with the um, a Federation of Master Builders talking about kind of the other side of, of this, which is the insulation, the best possible energy you can have, the greenest, cleanest is the energy you don't need to use. And how, you know, ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps have to go together with insulation. And you know, what we really need to do is present the government with a complete package. They really haven't done the thinking. They haven't got the expertise and the knowledge there. And perhaps trying to join up some more Federation of Master Builders, people talking about insulation and really join that up with community energy in a way that perhaps Transition Towns historically has done a bit of, seeing this all fit together. I'm thinking, you know, Ashley Hayes, quote unquote, first carbon neutral village, mm -hmm. is, is really giving, having a complete package that you can present to the government and say, hey, you can show this to the world um, and show that you're really doing things. And I was actually just thinking, you know, we're all seeing quite often, um, uh, you know, great projects in the global south projects in Africa, hey, we're getting out into places, you know, that previously haven't had electricity at all, and now they've got solar panels. If they can do that with very limited local resources, we have to be able to do it here. And I was noting in the comment about, you know, rural and remote and areas that are difficult to serve. Let's join all this up and, you know, give the government complete packages and say, here, you've just got to adopt that and go and run with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Building on that a little bit, just to, so some some final points. We've got five minutes left. Um, the um, Matthew raised it at the beginning about about business models, about kind of a crossroads in terms of how community organisations move forward with different energy opportunities, but the, the barriers that are in place. Afshin's mentioned the innovation work that, that repowering are doing and um, the, the, the the effort that has been put in, huge effort in the sector to to find ways forward and find new business models. But a couple of points in the chat, somebody talking about, uh, Paul, Paul from Energy for All talking about um, how do we compete with the scale and financial power of the commercial sector, um, Tom Broughton talking about the, the presenting community energy as, as in the benefit to, in the interests of um, government and, and helping the government um, take actions in the short term rather than long term. So um, actually that is a, a lot to tie up, but, but from your viewers, uh, again, at, at the head of a community energy organisation, how do you see 
these opportunities that we're talking about, what Natalie's just mentioned about connecting up community energy as a transition and really how it, it, can, it can collaborate and fuel and move forward. But in the context of the challenges that the sector has at the moment to actually be commercially viable and, and, and reach a much larger scale in a, in a rapid period of time that's, that's really required. Um, yeah, how would you tie all of that together? Uh, that is quite a huge challenge. Um, uh, you, what we're trying to do at Repowering is definitely try and link the aspects of green jobs with our work. And uh, we've you know, started with A, creating local jobs, having local community champions supporting uh, you know, the Repowering team and they're locally rooted. We're also keen to work alongside um, other organizations and join the dots. Uh, between creating training and work experience for, for young people so that uh, um, you know, they can enter uh, and benefit from the, the green uh, jobs that are, will be emerging. Um, so there's a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities uh, for us to not just look at the new business models and looking at scale. So we at Repairing are looking at how we can scale up our activities, shift from uh, just delivering, you know, uh, on, on individual estates. Now we're looking at borough-wide uh, projects and portfolios. Um, we're looking at how we access finance quicker so that we're not always waiting on uh, community shares so that we can install at scale. So there's lots uh, of groundwork that has already been put in place and that we're looking to launch off. Um, but the challenge is, I think, that uh, and is around resources so that we're still quite small teams uh, everyone's pretty much maxed out and you know it's uh, um, people are working because they're motivated and driven by purpose and really wanting to deliver impact and that's where I think you know Matt was talking about how do we work with local authorities and I think that's where the alignment is so important where we can only achieve um, net zero as a nation or, and you know for everyone to do their bit and, and everyone to collaborate so this is not a time for us to be precious about boundaries you know local authorities need to do business differently and need to be embracing uh you know that collaborative spirit and and work with their lo their local communities where they exist and uh i think with the climate emergencies being announced uh, we are seeing more local authorities approach us and being more open uh to the uh, having those discussions and dialogues so i hope uh, I hope this year, you know, we're going to see more momentum coming from local authorities because they are now uh, recruiting officers. So they are building their resources internally because ultimately, you know, local authorities do have an important role to play and government recognizes that. So I think that's where our, um, as practitioners and organizations, that's where alliance will be in terms of they might be tight for resources and, um, and people power. We've got some that we can give, let's join forces so that we can really create that future. So I, yeah, I definitely feel like lot, lots more to be done. I think it's quite exciting landscape for us to be working in. And uh, yeah, this, you know, this is, this is the time for, re, you know, for community energy to really grow in scale. Uh, and yeah, we just need to be able to demonstrate that. Thank you. Um, sorry, Matt, uh, I would love you to come in. I would love Rachel to come in as well, but we've, we've hit the end of the time. Um, I think that was a really positive note and encouraging note from, from Ashley to finish the session on. Um, and uh, as you can as you can hear everyone, there's a, um, even though it might have been general agreement between the panel, there's a lot there in terms of um, the opportunities and challenges that are, are involved in the sector. And really that highlights why we wanted to talk about this because um, COP does shine a different kind of light on the sector than we might have been used to in the past few years. And um, the the, the how we take that forward as a sector and how we respond to it I think is, is, is really why we're here today um, so thank you very much to the three panelists and uh, guest appearance from Natalie who will also be featuring in the next panel um, uh, it's really really interesting and really value all your thoughts and, and views so thank you for um, participating and sharing with us so next, um, if I can, or hope you all got the stamina to stay for a, a, a little bit longer before a break, um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Duncan Law, who's um, the Policy and Advocacy Manager at Community Energy England, and he is going to lead us through into the next panel. Over to you, Duncan. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I'm just going to get hold of my notes, which it's <laughs> trying to prevent me doing. There we are. 
Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to our panelists. Um, this uh, section is a slightly different focus, um, and I hope it will throw up inspiration and uh, material uh, to stimulate you all in the um, breakout room conversations later, because um, a, a number of people have said one of the big challenges is how do we argue uh, that community energy is essential to achieving net zero to our various governments, but also how do we um, use the community energy as an opportunity to engage uh, as many people as possible so that we are actually um, fulfilling our role of, of connecting and bringing people on. So our question is, how do we use the year of COP26 uh, to, um, to propel community energy and local climate action. So there are kind of two prongs to, to that question. Um, uh, the Committee on Climate Change agrees with Afshin uh, saying it will not be possible to get close to meeting a net zero target without engaging with people or by pursuing an approach that focuses only on supply side changes, which I would argue is rather what the uh, ambition consists of in, in recent government policy announcements. Um, so not enough. Um, community Energy England has been working with a number of community energy organizations to try and think what we are going to do at COP. So, and if anybody would like to join those conversations, please email me d.law at communityenergyengland.org with community energy at COP in the subject line. And we will welcome you into that, uh, that um, group uh, and we've identified sort of three aims to ensure people and communities are recognized internationally as critical to achieving net zero and two to get the uk government to put in place exemplary policy to demonstrate one which is not happening and third to see states adopting realistic policies which really involve people and communities to meet ambitious uh, climate goals so um, I would like now to introduce the panel who are going to help us answer this two-pronged question. Um, and I will go alphabetically too. Uh, is Syed there? I can't see him, but I'm sure he is. I'm uh, in the way, Duncan. He is, <laughs> great. Uh, Syed Ahmed, uh, who many of you will know as the chair of Community Energy London, which he co-founded in 2017. Uh, he's worked in sustainable energy for more than two decades and founded a think tank energy for london with huge resources on it uh, he's a director of the parliamentary uh, renewable and sustainable energy group uh, the first um, all-party parliamentary group this is the the solar trade association he's a trustee of the national energy action uh, and has worked for friends of the earth the gla the chp association the government he's uh, a community energy policy guru for me, certainly. Um, and I, in fact, what I would like to do, I think, is to introduce everybody and then ask them each to do their minute of, 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 of uh, anything I've missed and why they're here. Um, Baroness Natalie Bennett of Manor Castle, to give her her full title. Um, Make it Natalie, please. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. Um, I was the leader of the Green Party from 2012 to 2016, has been involved in community energy in Sheffield and is a staunch advocate of the importance of community energy and people-led solutions, uh, a great ally in the House of Lords for us. And finally, Steve Shaw um, is a great parliamentary campaigner working on the local electricity bill uh, with his organisation powerforpeople.org.uk. He has uh, managed to get 257 MPs to support this uh, bill to get local supply allowed in this country. He was involved in the climate change bill in 2008, before 2008, and the Sustainable Communities Act, and he does an amazing job of advocating for community energy in uh, Parliament. We have much to learn and we intend to work closely, uh, more closely together. So um, over to Syed to, to tell me what I've missed and to say why he's here and part of this discussion. Cheers Duncan, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me today and um, 
Uh, really great to see a number of our members from Community Energy London, SE24 Energy, Crew, CLC and Repowering here today, amongst others, I'm sure. Um, just to say, Community Energy London, uh, as you mentioned, Duncan, was formed about four years ago. Uh, the principal idea behind um, um, forming Community Energy London was London has, and many cities have, their own specific challenges in bringing forward community energy infrastructure because of the, the nature of the built environment and the costs associated with delivering these projects uh, within cities. Uh, the key thing we wanted to do to really promote community energy has been touched on in the earlier session. That was to really build partnerships and links uh, with the public sector, with local authorities and in London with the mayor of London as well. And I think we've been uh, quite successful in doing that by highlighting the excellent works that the groups do and really building those linkages between what the mayor and what local authorities have set out as priorities and their environmental and on their social agenda and highlighting to them how community energy groups can help deliver those policy goals in the most effective manner possible. And, and the key things about, oh, and this is not me, this is the groups, the groups are delivering at scale numbers of projects in London and such that uh, the policymakers are feeling confident enough that they want to continue to build that relationship. And just to say that relationship between local authorities and community energy was not set out a decade ago. We have been spending a number of years now to try and build that relationship. And the community energy, sorry, the climate emergency declarations are only helping that dialogue uh, further. I'll, I'll touch upon that as we go along, Duncan, but that's all I'd like to say at the moment. Lovely, thank you. Um, over to Natalie. Well, thanks very much. And I think perhaps the most useful thing I can contribute at this point is a sort of political overview. And one of the strange things that we're going to see in the next couple of days, I've just had a piece on left foot forward, is the House of Lords is now actually the centre of political resistance in Westminster. Um, with the 80 major seat majority of the government in the Commons, and they're prepared to just to bulldoze things through. What we've got coming up in the next couple of days is the Lords at least kicking up a very large fuss and maybe standing firm on things like protecting the mortgage prisoners, protecting people who've been victims of the cladding scandal, the building safety scandal. Um, and so traditionally NGOs campaigners haven't really looked at the House of Lords very much. They've focused on the Commons, particularly in recent years where there's been you know, uncertain government majorities. But the House of Lords really can be a tool for you. And I'll actually just stick in the um, in the chat box now a little piece that I wrote reflecting on of my first year in the Lords, but really that's meant to be a guide to how you can use the House of Lords um, as, a, as a way, as campaigners, as people who are trying to advocate for your industry. We're there. And you know, one of the things that I and other, other enthusiastic members from a range of parties can do is we have the chance to put down 12 written questions a week um, that we can put to the government. So if you really want to pin them down on something, and this is particularly useful if there's something you know is going wrong, but you kind of don't want to um, get the, uh, the civil servant who told you about it into trouble. If you ask them a question and it's phrased right and they have to answer it, then you can show how you know this thing that you actually knew anyway. But um, written questions, we've of course got the environment bill coming up, which is going to be enormous. And one of the things I think we really have to do is use that environment bill to put out um, the really big picture things to, to, to create the image, to paint the picture, not necessarily things that we're going to, um, to get into the law in this bill. Um, but one of the great things many people I think haven't realised in the House of Lords, um, every amendment that gets put down, there is a debate on it. Um, unlike the Commons where only the Speaker selects which amendments are going to be debated and there's usually only a handful you, it's some of the big bills, you know, and I, well, I think we'll break this. I mean, domestic abuse bill, we had 240 amendments or something like that. Uh, the agriculture bill was something similar. So this, this is a real mechanism you can use. And the government is going to have to look at the issue, formulate a response for the minister to write. It's a real way of getting in through the political process. So um, you really think of the House of Lords as a resource and the parliamentary process you know, it won't always deliver what you want, but it can really shift the Overton window, shift the debate, get people thinking differently, um, and you know, force feel civil servants at least and kind of ministers to engage. Thank you. We will. <laughs> and uh, now over to Steve. Hello. Thank you, Duncan. And uh, apologies for me being a little late. Um, I was uh, I was in a meeting that is about what I'm about to tell you. So. Um, I was, you know, doing important things. Um, 
So I'd like to, I'd like, I want to, I want to give an update really on, um, on the local electricity bill, but first just a quick overview. I presume many of you are familiar with it. Um, what we are trying to achieve is to actually get the, the rules, the regulations that are, that run, um, the market, um, amended so that we can have community energy schemes able to sell, um, locally to supply locally. Um, we want we want to make new schemes viable, and we want existing schemes, if they want, to be able to benefit from, from this. Um, that is the ultimate aim here, um, and we have drafted the local electricity bill with that aim in mind. Um, a lot of you I know, and many others have have given really uh, welcome feedback on the detail. It is a short bill at the moment; it's only a page. Um, and we are going to need to work on the detail to get to get the, to actually make sure it achieves its aim. But for now, um, it is about a campaign to actually get the legislation introduced and to a stage in Parliament where we're actually working to get that detail right means something. Um, but I do. It's, it's been two years that we've been building building up the support and building up this campaign, um, and I have quite a quite a exciting update for you today um which is that um we've just had agreement from the uh shadow front bench um so from the labor front bench that they will back the bill um so that effectively brings the number of mps that support it up to three uh 360 or around 360. now that is well over half the house of commons um and so which is fantastic um, and indeed, all of you have helped. Thanks so much. You know, this has been two years plus of hard campaigning, getting MPs on board. Um, it's been a wonderful turnaround with regards to the Labour Party, because many Labour MPs across last year were writing to constituents, to supporters, perhaps to yourselves, and saying, you know, they didn't really feel that it would work um, and that it might promote diesel generation and so on. Um, we, we've, we've made a small amendment to close that loophole. Um, and that's been, that's been great. And indeed now we have Labour MPs, um, I know Ben Bradshaw and Exeter, for example, had a supporter from him last week, um, send his new message saying, yep, we're totally behind this now, you know, can't wait to fight for it once it gets reintroduced in Parliament. So this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant situation. We're in a really strong position now. Now, by no means is this in the bag but it's, it's very good. Now we are gonna go for a thing called the private members ballot, which is next month. It's on the 20th of May, 20 backbench MPs get drawn out of a hat. We need to get one of the first seven to take up the bill. It's a bit of a weird arcane process, but it's a very, very good opportunity for us. We need one of those top seven MPs. So as soon as they're drawn, um, we're going to need to lobby them, try and persuade them to take up this bill. Um, there'll be lots of other options that they might take. So we're going to need you to please help. Um, so please do um, keep an eye on our newsletter, sign up to it if you haven't got it. And please, at the moment we know when you get the message, please lobby those MPs and urge them to take up our bill. If we succeed, then we've got a really good fighting chance of seeing the legislation actually go through Parliament and become law within the following 12 months. Brilliant, Steve. We will definitely channel that when the time comes and uh, work with you to to harness those MPs. Thank you. And thanks for all the work you've done over the last. Thank you all, all of you, for all the work you've done over the recent years on this. So moving to um, more specific questions, um, are there specific opportunities uh, that COP26 presents community energy um, for both engagement with uh, with their communities and getting policy change, and how do we harness them? Shall I jump in first, Duncan? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so I, I did sense that there was a, a little bit of cynicism in the first session about uh, the COP26 process, and I understand it's one of those big international events where if it does go ahead in the way it has done in the past, we'll have literally thousands of people flying in to be a uh, kind of locked into a massive debating room for the best part of two weeks arguing about whether or not it should be a comma or a full stop in the negotiating text all very kind of arcane rules but uh, just to say those arcane kind of rules and discussions then are then those those rules that document is then taken home uh, the the agreements are eventually transposed to some laws and if you think back to like kind of the Rio Earth Summit and Kyoto Lots of those things that were pledged at that time have now 
kind of wended their way into our, our kind of public discourse and our, our laws. So they do have an effect. So uh, though it can be uh, very obscure and opaque, uh, the, the things that come out of the negotiations are fundamentally important. If we didn't have the targets that were setting uh, on, on the ultimately the, the climate change and carbon reduction targets, they then can't be then set out into policies which allow Steve and Natalie and other people to talk about new policies and new programs that kind of support the, the, the decarbonisation agenda. So that's just one thing to say that there is a bridge there between those negotiations and what we see day to day actually in our streets, everything from air quality to public transport to green spaces, there will be a link there. So I'm, I'm more heartened. Um, one of the things that Matthew mentioned earlier on very importantly is the next period of time to get to the reduction to net zero, the next 50%, is the more challenging one because we have to go away from the supply side interventions as you mentioned as well Duncan to literally millions of interventions in our neighborhoods in our homes on our streets and spaces and that's going to be a bit more challenging because it involves people it's a lot easier to go somewhere in the middle of nowhere and build a big power station rather than go and retrofit literally tens of thousands of homes as a government have found out uh, 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 in their mistake with the Green Homes Grant recently. So um, how do we, uh, your question was, how can we get community energy to kind of prosper from some of these negotiations going forward? Well, first and foremost, just a message to Rachel. I mean, the government aren't doing a very good job in actually trying to galvanize the public in these discussions. So if you look at the COP26 work at the moment, there's, there is a campaign called Together for Our Planet and it's tried to bring in together universities, kids, an awful lot of businesses, but there's not an awful lot there in the public. So that's one thing. So the government really need to get themselves moving immediately uh, to try and really galvanize the public into the debate. Uh, the second uh, bit is, is that we have, you know, we clearly have a public who are much more tuned to climate change, really, really championing many of the technologies that community energy groups want and actively you want to participate and the government is not making it easy. So the government do need to kind of realize that there is a real appetite there and do something about this. And I'll, I'll stop for a moment because I've got some further ideas, but the, the third thing as well is, is bringing in local authorities into that debate, as I mentioned, and you know, kind of the, many of the local authorities are very keen about trying to talk about uh, the COP. And I know the local government association has really got itself together in trying to make representations in Glasgow and that's really encouraging as well so lots of pieces are on the board uh, but the biggest player uh, the government is absent at the moment and we really need to see some movement there which will help bring along that debate to the public and to community energy action. I'll, I'll come back further later on uh, Duncan. Thanks Syed um, and I forgot to remind people please to ask questions on around this question in the chat and uh, I will try and feed them in in the next uh, 20 minutes um, and also use the chat to discuss as well if you feel like it. Um, thank you Syed. Can I pass on to Natalie uh, with the with the kind of qualification that we would really like to focus on stuff we can do to influence. So uh, Syed said the government is absent. Well, what do we do <laughs> to, to haul them in, to make them present, to make them understand that they have, to, that in fact, what they have, as I see it, is a, a fatally compromised policy. They have a world leading ambitious NDC, which is simply not going to be delivered unless they change and make their policy uh, that, that supports grassroots uh, involvement. I was just thumping my forehead because every time I hear the world with the word world leading, you know, I, I, I have to try to strain myself in the house from screaming and I, I do pick them up on it quite often. Um, but um, I think you, I go back to um, Julia Hartley Brewer, um, a, um, a talk radio host at LBC, some might know, a shock jock and depends on the day, but often she's a climate change denier. Um, and um, she said to me grumpily before Christmas, everyone's talking green now. And I think one of the things that we do have to acknowledge and, and you know, celebrate is it's no longer viable for the government to deny the need for action. 
Um, so one of the key things to do is really keep the pressure up because, I mean, I had a, a journalist um, call, I had a long chat with sort of off the record, just a briefing type chat um, a couple of weeks ago from a, from a sort of non-green kind of outlet, just an ordinary political outlet. Um, and this journalist was was sort of, you know, puzzled and was like, well, the government talks green so much. And, you know, th 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 you, um, Zach Goldsmith, you know, they, they hold him up as this great green, green champion and, and Carrie Simons in number 10. And... But, but, but she reached the point of realising, but, but they don't actually seem to be doing anything, delivering anything on the ground. And, you know, I had to really be careful in talking to her and pointing out, yes, that's fact, right, and her gut feeling was entirely right, um, while not being too depressing, because the fact that they have moved on to talking about the green stuff and, you know, not in just a pure greenwashing kind of way, they acknowledge the need for action is progress. So one of the things that everyone can do, you know, whether you're on a call like this, whether you're on social media, whether you're in meetings, meetings with the government, um, whether you're talking to other parts of the industry, is really make it clear that, it's, that everyone knows that they are not world leading in climate action. They are actually trailing well behind and getting that message across to all of the um, you know, people who aren't, this isn't their main area, they're not really paying that much attention, they hear the government say the words green, green, world leading, world leading a lot. Um, it really needs to be clear to those people that the government is failing in action. And that's something that everyone can do all of the time to get that message across. And the more it comes from your obviously non-partisan, in a party political sense, people who are saying, you know, here I am, I'm trying to put in the solar panels and this is in my way, or, you know, I really want to put in this, this, this uh, community owned uh, onshore wind uh, farm and all of this is in my road and the government's failing to support the way it should. All of those really practical messages, and, you know, don't discount the power of local newspapers, local radio, BBC radio, use those outlets to really, um, you know, if there's real public understanding to shift the ground, then, you know, this is a government that follows. It's not a government that's going to lead on anything whatsoever. So you know, build that public determination, the public saying, you know, where is the action? And that's what I'd say needs to be done. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Um, challenge. Uh, talk about the changes that are needed. You use local uh, local avenues for publicity about what you're doing and what needs to change. That's that's great. Steve, um, without telling us exactly what we need to do just to support your bill, um, you can tell me that privately and I will put it out in newsletters. Um, do you have any uh, hot tips uh, and um, actions that we can do to uh, get community energy uh, the credence and the support that it needs from government uh, and local government? I, so I think, and, and I, I mean, I have to speak from my area of sort of my real area of knowledge, which is, you know, um, helping people to advocate uh, more effectively to their elected representatives. Um, so I will talk more generally and not just about the local electricity bill. Um, but when you are communicating, you can use it as a backdrop. So of course, you know, your councillor or your MP, you know, isn't, isn't going to be able to uh, go, go to the COP and, and stand up and, and, and make speeches and so on. Um, but using, but ex using it as a backdrop can help to say, to say that it's happening now and how important it is a good a good thing i've noticed in the past um that works well particularly with maybe the more uh on the fence type people um is is to flip it round and to say how when there is um when there's good domestic leadership or regulatory changes or, or mechanisms in place um, a great example is the climate change act in the uk then that actually helps give the uk leverage um, to push other nations at the cop um, and indeed you know after the climate change act was passed in the uk many other nations passed similar legislation um, so you know you can sort of almost flip it around to make your your own communication with with local authority with your local authority particularly with mps i think um you can give that as a backdrop um that's the most sort of that's the that's the most direct uh, piece of advice i'd have again you know based based on what i'm saying of course if you're actually lobbying ministers which you might be doing I, I, we're probably going to ask you to do it for the our bill um at some point or indeed if you're asking mps to lobby ministers you know then of course it's much more direct in that you know uh, the government are going to want to, at the very least, look good at the COP. Um, and so, you know, making sure that they support things like the local electricity bill um, is going to help them to be able to say they're doing things like that. So 
Oh, Sai is shaking his head. Oh, okay, we've got debate. <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, Syed, were, were, were you shaking your head? Do you need to respond? No, I wasn't. Forgive me. I was uh, contributing to chat at the same time as into Steve. I think uh, Steve's work on the local electricity bill is bringing together, is bringing really a real issue around local energy supply, which has been talked about for 20 years, but not really grappled by government. And I think the period of time that we've had passed is really bringing these new options, because even if we did not have climate change as an issue to consider, there has been a real transition in the energy sector down to decentralised energy technologies, bringing energy efficiency and the efficiency of local supply to the heart of the discussion. And that's not only here, that's worldwide. And so, um, you know, there, there, there does need to be a review of the electricity supply industry and the supplies and who is best there to you know, kind of support, uh, you know, the public in terms of uh, in terms of their energy needs. And so uh, Steve bringing this debate into the House of Commons and the House of Lords is really welcome. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, in the chat from Paul Farr from Energy for All um, about engaging with local authorities. Mm -hmm. um, local authorities have to be a big part of the transition. They control a lot of the local infrastructure and, uh, that we live in. Uh, and community energy needs to work with them. How do we do that? Said, can I start with you as being probably the mo our most experienced spokesperson on that? Um, well, experience in the sense that we've we've recognised at Community Energy London the real critical need for local authorities, uh, probably more so than many rural areas because of the limited space in London to develop our projects. We really need community groups to work hand in hand with local authorities to kind of access the spaces, the sites, uh, the money, the promotion of the projects. And so uh, we've been kind of like liaising with local authorities for several years now. And luckily in the last 18 months, partly because of the climate emergency declarations, that's provided us with a real conduit to kind of speed up those discussions. So just to say uh, out, of London, out of London's 33 boroughs, 29 have now signed climate emergency declarations. Out of those 29, about 16 have published climate emergency plans. Uh, with the other 13, uh, you know, um, kind of publishing those probably in the next few months. Uh, what we've underdone, uh, what we've uh, t undertaken is uh, we secured some funding uh, from uh, Deep Breath, the Micro Generation Certification Scheme Charitable Foundation. Uh, many thanks to them uh, to undertake a review of those plans in London and more importantly, how they're looking to use their plans to engage the public on a wide range of environmental initiatives, including community energy. And we we're really pleased to say, see, I think we have at least 12 of the London local authorities of the 14 who've published their plans, who are saying that they would like to see community energy activity grow in their borough. We've seen four boroughs already set up distinct community energy funds. And uh, there is a, I would, say, I would say almost unique, it's not completely unique to London, but we do have carbon offset funding, uh, which means an awful lot to a lot of people, but under planning rules in London, there are, there are some funds that local authorities can tap into. And um, they, that money from new development, which cannot achieve a net zero target must be ring fenced and use for carbon reduction projects in the borough. Uh, boroughs are now really stepping up to make sure they secure that funding. And we are seeing money going into community energy activity as a consequence. I'm getting a bit far away from our COP26 route, but just to say, I, I think I mentioned early on, local authorities are really keen to shout out what they're doing on climate issues. COP26 provides them for a route to do that. And as I mentioned, the LGA is looking at this work as part of their kind of contribution to Glasgow. So we just need to encourage the local authorities to raise their debate around climate and environmental issues and look to see where they can galvanise community energy action wherever possible in their borough and support it. And that doesn't only mean community energy groups per se, but it could be local community groups who are working on anything from local food production to air quality to cycling uh, and then ask them to see whether or not they'd like to see how they can support community energy action and provide them with that ability to do so by marrying them up with groups. And that's 
certainly what Community Energy London's been doing. Thank you. And did you think that the 12 uh, groups that have mentioned Community Energy had been particularly lobbied by Community Energy groups for that to, to appear in their emergency plans or is it just right thinking? No, uh, there's a, probably a bit of both, but I think actually we've been lobbying them. So uh, sales members and sale itself, Community Energy London, has been meeting with uh, London Local Authority Energy Officers for at least three, four years, if not longer on some, some groups have had their um, relationships with their local boroughs for some time. Uh, we're a member of something called the Association of Local Energy Officers. So Community Energy London uh, attends their quarterly meetings. We highlight uh, what kind of... Uh, um, um, projects and programs the groups have got in place. Community Energy London also has had a, a meeting every month for the last four years. In good times it used to be at City Hall, now we do it online and we have a very high number of um, energy officers from local authorities have signed up. I mean by and large to say local authority energy officers completely understand that community energy is a powerful role to help them deliver their goals. You often have a local authority with two or three officers how they're going to divide, uh, you know, deliver net zero. They need to reach out and make these partnerships, not only with local businesses, but with community groups. It's just making sure that they persuade their elected officials as well to kind of support them in the kind of options they're coming through. So there, there is a spectrum of different kind of abilities and support that the local authorities are doing, but I'm, I'm, I'm positive that it's kind of moving forward and the next iteration of climate plans that we'll probably see in 2022, 2023, I'm hoping will be a lot more robust on community energy. It's a, it's a long race, this, it's not a sprint. Uh, these targets are 2030 for net zero, and they'll probably go beyond that. Establishing those relationships with community groups is probably something that we need to look to over that period of time. So I'm not worried if we have small steps back because the direction of travel is positive. Thank you. Um, uh, so the message is engage with your local authority, even if you found it intensely difficult up to now. Um, Sue Meekin says, I'm not sure councillors appreciate or understand community energy. Uh, can some training be delivered by the, the LGA, please? Yes, please, LGA. <laughs> but by, um, <coughs> by it, training can also be delivered by individual groups. Uh, and another feedback I got from my local council is that the reason they're not talking about climate change in the chamber is because it's actually a very small part of their post bag so it's down to community energy to up the proportion of post bag that is about the emergency and how community energy so it's worth it's worth writing to councillors as well and engaging with uh, elected members just one quick thing Duncan very quickly just to say uh, in next year May is the London local elections so part of the reports what we're doing is to make sure that we can brief all councillors ahead of that We've also developed a new Community Energy London map which shows every ward and where community energy projects in London are, as well as every parliamentary constituency. So we'll be using those tools to help groups to actually lobby their councillors and educate them. But the point is very well made. Councillors have been involved in a lot of things. They do not know their community projects well. Brilliant. Natalie, you had your hand up. I was just going to say, in terms of the House of Lords, there's a fairly new group called Peers for Planet, mm -hmm. which has about 120 um, members of the House of Lords on it. And, you know, it very much aims for a kind of slightly the lowest common denominator would be unfair, but some of the people who are on it have only discovered climate change is an issue round about the start of 2021. Um, and so it's a really good educative tool. It's quite well both the House of Lords standards quite well resourced. So I think it would be definitely worth, you know, looking at, at reaching out. Um, Lynette is, is, is the sort of chief officer of that. Very, very good. Um, and, you know, make some contact there. And I'm seeing lots of discussion about in the chat about training local government, um, you know, a general training session for the House of Lords, I think potentially would go down quite well and Peers for Planet would be a really good way to do it. Excellent. Thank you. We will, we will take that as an action. <laughs> um, there's another question from Paul. Paul, you're monopolising. Is there anything in the new EU directives that can specifically promote community energy and can it be used to put pressure on our government in any way post-Brexit? There is, there is the, the, um, the right to energy communities to, to generate and sell and share uh, energy. Does that have any relevance post-Brexit, Natalie? Or Steve, or both? Um, well, we, we've noticed that um, certainly some MPs 
responded very well when we told them about various, you know, much better things that happen in different countries in Europe. But what we've also noticed is others don't. Um, <laughs> and I, I, um, I think um, that sort of sense of, well, and, and to a degree, there's often justification, which is, well, you know, uh, obviously, you, you, you've got to be a bit careful when you compare large, complicated nations, um, and our system is different to theirs, and for a whole set of complicated reasons, etc. So sometimes, you know, it, it is it is coming from... A, a, and not not a bad place to sort of say hang on you can't just say that just because in germany they have all this great stuff happening we can just click our fingers and do it here so so if you are going to compare to good things or good plans that are happening in eu nations i think you need to just just sort of be careful um what i've noticed always works well is if i do i always then you know talk about the UK context, the specific solution that we want, you know, the benefits it's going to bring to UK communities, you know, UK net zero, et cetera, um, and not make it sound too much like I'm just saying, you know, Denmark can do this and we can't, so we should be able to. Yeah, brilliant. Natalie, you're on mute. Sorry, um, I confess that I'm sometimes um, uh, guilty of doing that. Well, Denmark can do this. Why can't we? But, you know, I am a politician. Um, but I think, you know, Steve's right in terms of particularly as as campaigners, as advocates, um, you definitely show that it's possible by using continental European examples in particular. I mean, it's also interesting. There's lots of interesting examples out of the US. And, you know, particularly perhaps with our current government, using US examples is a way of not, um, you know, bringing up uh, eliciting Brexit reflexes. Um, but if you can find examples from other parts of the world, that can be a way of perhaps partially going around that political problem. Thank you. Yes. If it's been done before, there's no reason why it shouldn't be done here. It's always my, it takes the threat away. Um, uh, we're drawing towards uh, a close now, and then there will be a break. Everybody will be delighted to hear. Um, uh, John Taylor mentions that, um, that, uh, councils are um, recruiting climate change and uh, cl uh, climate plan officers. Uh, and so that's a really good uh, chance to build a relationship with somebody new and even possibly to get one of your members to get the job. Um, <laughs> and that the RCEF contacts and other staff at energy hubs um, are very useful for liaising with local authorities. So um, I would like to ask uh, each panel member to come up with a top recommendation for the most useful and powerful and not too difficult uh, action that they can do and if they want to do one for central government and uh, or local government and one for the people then that's fine so um can we start with natalie well, for the people, I would say don't use the word co-benefits, but talk about co-benefits. Um, you, one of the things is you know, talking about. I often talk about we have you know this year has been different for different reasons, but in a normal year, um, we have the you know a horrendous level of excess winter deaths because of the poor quality of our housing stock and people switching off the heating and shivering in winter because they can't afford it. So talking about community energy as a way of tackling that poverty, that inequality, that public health saving the NHS money, you know, just as when you're talking about active transport, talk about how that tackles obesity and diabetes and everything else, um, really present that clear package of how the community, the people benefits. And that's for the people. And also I think you know very much for local councillors and even, even for um, government ministers, et cetera. Um, and for government ministers, you suggest, focusing on the local prosperity, the way in which this brings money, people invest money in their local community, they then get their dividends back and they then spend the money in the local community. So, if, you know, if you must use, I won't, but if you must use levelling up agenda, by all means, press the government buttons, you know, find what things press government buttons and, and run with them. Lovely. Thank you. That's great. Um, Steve. Um, I, I would echo Nat Natalie uh, when I'm when talking about the local um, there's just so m many great stories about what community energy is doing and so few people in the UK councillors just the public just have no idea that all this great stuff is happening um, obviously it's not happening enough but it, what I, what is happening is just so impressive we're always pushing out on our various channels all the great stories there seems to be an endless amount of, of really great stories communicate to your councillors 
um, but also to, to just to spread the word as, as in any way you can. Um, it, it's it's a, it's such a shame that more people just don't realise how fantastic the projects are and the work they do in communities, especially the knock-on work. You know, um, helping food banks and you know com, um, contributing towards um, local legal assistance and oh, it's just amazing. Um, and then of course nationally, you know, what I'm going to say, but. There's nothing more powerful than asking something specific. Um, and so, you know, please help us get this bill through Parliament um, and actually make that concrete change to the rules. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Syed. Uh, just very quickly, building on Natalie's point as well, uh, which I thought was very good about uh, talking about code benefits, but not mentioning the jargon, which I thought was very, very good. I think part of that, we've all had uh, the best part of a year now, more than a year, actually, sitting around in our local environment, looking at trees slightly different, looking at the shops slightly different. So we've got to know our local neighbourhood a lot better. And so I think linked to Natalie's as well, it's thinking about what the vision for your local area is. And I think if you think about what that vision is that you want for yourself, for your family, for your kids, for your local community, an awful lot of it will touch upon the changes that actually climate and energy campaigners are asking as well. We want green spaces, we want air quality to be better, we want local jobs. There's an awful lot of it that chimes very strongly with the climate debate. It's just not made very well. Uh, and just on Steve's point about, um, you know, shouting out the message, we recently um, advertised for some project officers and I thought Community Energy London is really great. Everybody knows us. None of the project officers knew us. They found out about us through environment job. These were very clever people. So it's, it's, it, we're, you know, it's beholden on us to kind of think continuously about how we can promote the projects because the people's bandwidth is limited and, you know, there's so many other things going on. So no matter what we're doing, we'll probably need to quintuple efforts to make sure that community energy is understood a lot better at both the local and national level. I think I'll stop there, Duncan. Thank you. That, that was great. And if I had to summarise that, it's about uh, telling the great stories as widely as possible, but also channeling them to the people who can make decisions uh, and change at the stroke of a pen um, and being visionary because vision vision changes the chemistry um, and it's often not part of the community of the climate debate so the benefit thing um, also allows us to celebrate which is um, much more engaging than wagging fingers or um, uh, producing work programs and and um, I think when I put out my uh, communication to all the members saying please help us uh, um, leave a cop it's going to be about uh, that telling the stories, showcasing, celebrating, using the strengths and the benefits. Um, make a film, write to your MP, have an event, um, invite your MP to the, the event, film it, um, show it during Community Energy Fortnight, recycle it during the great big green weeks in September, um, use it as your general, get it on your MP's Facebook uh, a photo, you know, headline photograph, um, all of these. The benefits piece is something that we've been working on for a long time and it's really difficult. Uh, we have a group of brilliant people uh, who are meeting irregularly. If you would like to be part of that or have stuff to contribute, please again, email me d.law at communityenergy.org. Uh, we're meeting uh, next week uh, and we'd love more people to be um, sharing the load um, and the very exciting work around that. So we've uh, running slightly late, uh, got to the end of that excellent, fascinating uh, um, panel. Thank you to all uh, the panelists and to everybody who asked questions. Um, we're now going to have a break, hooray. Uh, uh, there are key speakers after the, the break. So, uh, and then we will uh, um, be moving into breakout rooms. Uh, so please do come back after the break um, and which is in five minutes time only, um, and uh, see you then. Philip will be taking us on. Thanks everybody, see you in five minutes. Bye-bye.
you're still here and um, we're, we're really pleased that you're all here um, and, and kind of keen to participate today. Um, I'm going to move on to the next phase of the event, um, which is hearing from some uh, of our important uh, sponsors and supporters. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Tom. No, what have we got first? Sorry, <laughs> just checking. Uh, so I'm going to start by introducing uh, Beth Thorin from Patagonia. Uh, Patagonia have been supporting Community Energy England um, with this event and also Community Energy Fortnight, which is going to be in the summer. Um, you've heard mentioned uh, from Emma at the beginning, the uh, really exciting campaign that Patagonia have launched, trying to uh, bring kind of greater momentum behind community energy and involvement across Europe and beyond. And the, that's the We The Power campaign. Um, so uh, Beth is Environmental Action and Initiatives Director at Patagonia. She's joining us from the Netherlands today. Um, thank you again for, for supporting the event, Beth. And uh, we would love to hear from you more about uh, why Patagonia is supporting community energy in 2021. Great, very happy to be here. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, good. Um, rather than me talk, um, I thought I'd start by actually asking you to watch the trailer for the film um, so that you see what we're doing and the story that it tells. tells. It's, um, it's only a minute and a half and uh, it's, in, it's just been put in the, in the chat. And if you click on it, for the, I'll just be quiet for the first two minutes and, uh, and please have a watch. Uh, and uh, I'll be very curious to know what you think. Give you about 10 more seconds. Okay. I hope that most of you, uh, I saw a yay from somebody. <laughs> so at least one of you managed to watch it. That's great. Um, yeah. You know, in the last session, I was just listening to the end of it and the big message there was, you know, it's all about storytelling. And that was what we thought too. We thought actually this movement is full of really brave, smart people who are doing something that's so special and nobody knows about it. And it benefits communities, it benefits um, uh, climate change um, and the story hasn't been told. So that's what the purpose of that film is. And uh, if you get a chance to watch the full film, I, I will tell you, I'm biased, but I'll tell you it's quite interesting. Um, and it tells the story of four of the uh, community energy heroes uh, from across Europe uh, that, uh, and, and what they did to get going. And it's really quite inspiring. And I guess that's what we wanted to do, you know, because most people think of community energy as being out there, it's some, or, or actually energy, sorry, energy, uh, and something that big companies do. And so this was just to sort of change that mindset. And, um, and the idea is, is that once they've seen the film, they come to our website at Patagonia, but we as quickly as possible push them out to you. So we're pushing them out to Community Energy England. We're pushing them out to the federations all across Europe with the idea that people will actually take action. We want people to join and get involved in community energy. And we have an action that we, we say, join, invest or build. And, and join means become a member, switch your supplier, invest means invest X amount of money and build means, well, you know what building a community energy um, uh, invo involves uh, more, you know, more than I do. So, you know, I think um, the idea was to get as many people involved as possible. And our plan is to just keep going, support the legislative work across Europe, get businesses involved and see if we can begin to get the momentum going behind uh, and build a movement. And, and, that's, and that's what we're, we're aiming to do. And in terms of you know, what we've been doing as a company, we've been looking at, um, we've been talking to people all across Europe and you know, it certainly is incredibly different in different countries, you know, with Germany having nearly a thousand, which isn't that surprising, 
But actually what is really surprising is seeing a country like the Netherlands, which has 600 community energy um, uh, co-ops. So, you know, it's really different. And I, you know, and, and England is really struggling and a bit behind in terms of where they stand in terms of the legislation. And I very, very much hope that, um, that, we, can, um, that we can change that. Um, and I guess the other thing that we learned as we went around uh, talking to people is to not really talk about climate change. That was something else that became really clear. You know, this is a very broad movement uh, with broad appeal to many different people and talking about local jobs and local money and local, you know, looking after energy poverty, you know, of neighbors or building a community center. That was what was motivating. And, uh, and, the, and you know, climate change is a side benefit, which for a company like Patagonia, you know, that's why we're here, but it's not what we talk so much about. Um, so, so yeah, I haven't really answered the question that, uh, that uh, Philip posed to me, which is why is a big American company getting involved in this at all? And um, I guess it goes down to it, Patagonia is a, is a purpose-driven company. And uh, our mission statement is that we are in business to save our home planet. And I don't think there are very many companies that are in business to do good. And I think we're very lucky because we're a privately held company and we don't need to, you know, we don't need to sort of respond to shareholders. And I think that's an enormous advantage. Um, but I guess the way that we act and the way that what we try to do is A, be responsible ourselves. So cut our emissions, have, you know, I guess we have, we're the highest percent of uh, recycled product of any outdoor manufacturer, the highest percent of fair trade, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not here to really talk about Patagonia, but we do stuff that makes us a responsible company. And the other thing we do is we take 1% of our income and we give it away. And so we give it to charities. And we also, in addition to giving it away, we try to help them because we are pretty good at telling stories. We're marketeers. We're a company that sells stuff. And so what we do is we use that storytelling muscle to get behind ideas, ideas that we believe in. And uh, we are backing uh, Europe's longest river and uh, wild river and we are also back in community energy because we really believe in the potential it has to change to change our world and i guess really um that's it that's pretty much it it's uh, it's that broad appeal and it's um it's it's just meeting individuals needs so i guess um i'm going to pretty much stop there uh, we are, you know, within Europe, and I'm including the UK within Europe uh, for now, there are about 1.25 million people involved in community energy. There is a potential for that to be 260 million people. The work's been done, and we could be providing up to 50% of the energy within Europe. And that is what we need to be trying to do. And so, Patagonia is trying to help you guys and help people all across Europe make that a reality. And I hope that together we can do it because it would be really, really amazing for communities and for our planet. So thank you very much. Back over to Philip. Thank you, Beth, for those inspiring words. And yeah, we, we would encourage you to uh, watch the full video. Um, John shared the link in the chats on YouTube. So um, unless Beth tells me otherwise, you can just screen that publicly if you want to and share it around your community energy organizations and your networks. Um, so yeah, make, make use of it. It's a really high quality production and very inspiring. So uh, yeah, we think it might be a useful tool for you to engage new people in, in, in community energy and what it is and, and what you all do. Um, so thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to move on to Tom Hines, who is Managing Director of the company formerly known as Co-op Community Energy. Very well known to many of you in the sector. They're the biggest buyer of community generated electricity in the UK um, and a, a long standing supporter of Community Energy England and the sector as a whole. So Tom's got a, an exciting announcement, which some of you may have yes had a preview about, but Tom's going to run you through it in full now. Over to you, Tom. Brilliant. Thanks, Philip. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Uh, absolutely. It's not letting me do that at the moment. Uh, 
Let's go into participants. So yeah, I'm the only one that's bought a presentation with me, so apologies for that. There you so go. Yeah, Tom, it should work now. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. There we go. Right. Hopefully, you should all be able to see that. Yeah, that's working yeah, for me. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, as, as Philip said, we've been uh, co-op energy um, and me personally have been involved with um, uh, community energy for, for quite a long time and, um, you know, always proud to, to support these events and, and attend and speak where I can. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a, a background. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of familiar faces um, or at least names on the screen um, on the call uh, webinar today. So, um, but for those of you that don't know, um, Co-op Community Energy is a joint venture between the Mid Counties Cooperative, who are uh, the retail cooperative responsible for uh, Co-op Community Energy, the domestic supplier, uh, and Octopus Energy, uh, the business and domestic supplier. Um, our role is really split into two key areas. Um, first and foremost, and where we have most of our engagement today is, um, as Philip said, we we set up and arrange power purchase agreements uh, with community owned generators all across the UK, um, England, Scotland, Wales, and uh, we put those contracts in place by their electricity and all of the power that comes from those projects is then ring fenced for uh, Co-op Energy's community power tariff. Um, so that's a, a domestic energy tariff, 100% backed by um, PPA uh, contracts, um, so not just a Rego buying exercise, but direct relationships with those generators. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the benefits that comes out of switching to that tariff is that every customer that switches um, contributes into a fund, um, our community power fund. Um, we've so far distributed um, uh, six lots of, of, of cash out to community groups to support their initiatives. Um, so groups like South Hill, Awal Amantawe, um, Brighton uh, Energy Co-op, uh, Celsi um, and Harbury um, are, are the recipients so far. Um, and there'll be another round of that distributed uh, this summer, um, which is great news. Um, but really what I'm here to talk about is sort of the future and, and sort of where we are now and, and what our hopes are for the, the future and our plans going forward. Um, and it's always a bit dangerous going in the middle of the in the middle of a webinar because you hear so many interesting things and areas that you want to talk about but i'm going to try and stick to script but i might deviate a little bit as we go as we go forward but um we all know that that we need to see an increase in in new build renewable generation um and in particular we want you know communities and and people to play their part in not just owning that generation but having a say in how the the surpluses from that generation how the benefit from that generation can have a real impact in in the communities in which they operate um, and that's that's really at the core of what it is we're, we're trying to do um, with with various initiatives which i'll touch on later um, so we are exceptionally proud of of our parent companies and and working with them uh, the mid counties cooperative and and octopus energy um, you know there, there was a lot of talk earlier about um, uh, how important it is going to be for uh, domestic customers, for everyday people whose who's perhaps only engagement in the energy industry is, is via their energy consumption at home and their energy bill, how, how big an impact they're going to need to have if we're going to reach our targets. And you look at what Octopus are trying to do with their, their innovative tariffs, particularly around their Agile tariff or their Go tariff, trying to switch consumer behaviour and, and really have that impact there. Um, but also the Mid Counties Co-op, who, who you know, they've been nominated this year for Co-op of the Year because of their work engaging with communities and, and the, the outreach that they do with their members. So we're extremely proud of that. But any time I meet a new community group or I have a conversation with a, a new potential partner, I spend the first 20 minutes explaining that we're not a supplier and that we're not, you know, we are separate to that. Um, and I think in order for us to achieve what we want to, we need to have our own identity and, and very clearly um, have, our, have our own platform um, with which we're, we're hoping to you know, help push forward community energy and create this movement that we need. 
Um, so because of that, um, we've decided to uh, take a new exciting name and a new rebrand, which is what we're, we're here to launch today. Um, so here's a nice little animation that um, our, our guys have worked on. Um, so Unity is the new name, um, still very much ties in and, and shows how proud we are of our, our parent companies. Um, but this is the brand that we're going to be operating under going forward. Um, and what I wanted to do was just take the opportunity to explain uh, what we're focused on and actually how it ties into a lot of what's been discussed today. Um, and these are our what we call our four pillars, our, our sort of reasons for being, our mission. Um, I'll start on the far right because the Inspire piece is actually extremely prevalent to particularly the first session this morning about you know we need to be creating a groundswell not just of existing community energy um, organizations and groups communicating better what they do but trying to inspire a new generation of, of community energy practitioners and we believe that that's something that we can have a real impact on um, one of the one of the best things about the the job that i have is i i've spent a lot of time when we were allowed to going up and down the country speaking to people but more recently on video calls um about what their priorities are and what their challenges are and, and this idea of diversity around not just investors and and that's a difficult thing to get diversity around investment but diversity of membership and participation and, and particularly diversities on boards and, and one of the big areas that i know groups are looking for is to particularly interest more young people to get involved um, and uh, to take on the mantle in, in some respects, but also provide new ideas and new ways of doing things. Um, so that's something that we're extremely passionate about and something we'll be focusing on um, to, the, to the point that we're looking at internships with, um, with Octopus Energy, but um, looking at community energy internships where uh, young people can have training on anything from project management through to um, submitting planning applications to uh, managing how to build all the health and safety implications. So quite a hands on approach there um, through to looking at uh, is there the opportunity that we can work with, for example, mid counties have a young cooperators network. Um, can we work with them to uh, help uh, these young cooperators? cooperators volunteer on the boards of their local community energy group really trying to drive forward more people into into that involvement um, but as well as as well as inspiring and trying to get more people involved we're also very keen on on the practical um, applications that we can have and the practical support and that's looking at new innovations and collaborating with existing groups or potentially new groups and helping them to facilitate either new build projects in a subsidy free environment and we're looking at quite exciting um, fund opportunities particularly for groups who struggle to access debt at the smaller end of the scale so looking at smaller smaller um, installations and i know some of the questions this morning we're talking about how big corporate developers um, have benefit because their access to finance is a lot cheaper well we're looking at some quite exciting things that we think could could help do that um, and help groups with that um, and some of the innovations could be uh, you know as, as 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 much as we're all embedded within the energy and particularly the community energy space the vast majority of people's entire engagement is their energy bill so is there a way for for domestic customers to invest in community energy via their electricity bill you know could that lower the hurdle rates for community investors so there's not the sort of 250 or 500 pound minimum upfront investment you can chip away at it on their energy bill over 12 months you know with a member owned energy supplier um, so all of these different things um, as well as trying to work with uh, groups to see how they can expand on their engagement with their membership and really drive forward this this uh, this member engagement members having a say in, in how generation surpluses are being spent and um, one of the things I wanted to tease uh, today is um, uh, we're about to launch uh, what we're, what's being called the Trading Dividend with Westmill Wind uh, Cooperative and Westmill Solar Cooperative. Um, and this is, this is about creating a circular economy within um, three cooperative organisations working together. Um, so 
very, very simply, because I know I don't have much time, um, but very simply, this is um, in the same way that you achieve a dividend by going down to your local co-op and buying a can of beans. And because you're trading with the cooperative that you're a member of, you get your dividend payment. We wanted to see if there was an opportunity to do this for an energy cooperative as well. So a West Mill Wind or a West Mill Solar, or there are a lot of members who, who are members of both. Um, if they switch to the community power tariff, because that's where all of the, the power comes from. Um, uh, so Westmore Solar and Westmore Wind both sell their electricity um, to us and, and that's ring fenced for the community power tariff. So for every member that switches onto that, the relative cooperative um, has agreed that they should be paid a dividend um, because they are trading with the cooperative and trading the product that their cooperative was set up to create. Um, so it's quite a simple um, concept, but all of the credits then, all of the trading dividends that they receive are then put onto their energy bill as a discount to that product as well. So we think this is a really interesting way to, first of all, strengthen the cooperative principles behind the community energy group. And, and Mark Luntley and Tom Parkins are very, very, the chairs of those societies are extremely focused on um, how they can better engage with members and strengthen those cooperative principles. Um, but also um, it, it just keeps that engagement and, and the aim is for any energy cooperative or energy group that want to look at this, we're trying to make it as replicable as possible. So we can pick this up and drop this on to any group across the country that would also like to see this happen with their members. So that's one example. Um, and then this piece around Inspire. So the, the last thing I, I, or one of the last things I wanted to talk about is um, as part of this Inspire um, piece that we're working on, we really wanted to look at um, how we can use, possibly aimed at a slightly younger generation, you know, the generations that are, uh, we know are more um, concerned around climate change uh, predominantly. Um, a picture competition that we wanted to uh, launch today. So this powerful pictures, um, we've got some nice prizes there that, um, uh, have been kindly donated by the parent companies um, and they're all donatable if, if whoever wins this competition wants to give it to a good cause. Um, but we'd encourage people to have a look at what they believe mean, uh, diversity means within community energy and inclusion. Um, submit uh, photographs to, uh, we're setting up an Instagram link, Instagram page, um, and submit their images there. Um, the, the competition will be judged by a panel and it'll run for about a month. Um, and the aim here is to use these images and, and work with the, the people who are submitting these to really promote community energy and try and raise a bit of awareness on slightly different platforms to where you'd normally expect to see it. Um, so we're really excited about this. It's, it's opening up today um, and you can visit our new website uh, and check out our social media if, if you want to take part in that. We'd love to see as many applications as possible. And lastly, uh, sorry, I realise I'm rattling through, but I'm very quickly running out of time. Um, the last uh, thing is just a taste of a, a bit of research that we've looked into um, that will be published very, very soon, um, which, which is our insights uh, document. And this is really looking at um, how the average domestic energy bill payer, their views on the energy, on renewable energy sustainability, um, supporting additionality via energy bills, um, how keen they would be uh, or how interested they are to um, support new build technology via an energy bill. Um, so this, this piece of work is, is helping us to steer what products we will be able to and we think will be successful in the future. And some of the interesting stats there, which which really jumped out at us, is that I think one of the accusations about um, you know the sustainability movement is that it's it's a sort of middle class hobby. Um, but we've we've seen that um, you know overwhelming majority of people surveyed, regardless of their income levels or background, were very concerned about community energy. Uh, uh, sorry, about climate change, um, and that we we knew that. Um, you know, it is the younger generations that are particularly engaged and want to take action to stop it. Uh, so the 16 to 24 year olds, 88 percent of those those people surveyed were, were extremely keen to take action. And 
I think there's an opportunity there for community energy to provide a platform on which to take action. Um, and this idea about supporting new build renewables by your energy bill um, and, and removing the barriers to investment there. Um, you know, 75% of people we think would, would be interested in, in supporting via that method. Um, so that is me and I hope I haven't overrun too much. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Lovely. Thank you, Tom. And yeah, thanks for your continued engagement with this sector. It's really good to see your uh, support and look forward to those insights coming out. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us swiftly on because we are behind a little bit um, to Chloe Uden, who's uh, going to talk to us about the Moths to a Flame tour, which is um, leading up to COP26. Um, so I'll just hand straight over to you, Chloe. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you ever so much for um, uh, inviting us to talk about this project. Um, Tom, you'll be pleased to know that you are not the only person who's going to share their screen, and I'm going to attempt to do that too. Um, so, um, the Art and Energy Collective is a group of artists, makers, thinkers and tinkers who are trying to use our skills to respond to the climate emergency. And we specialise in participatory arts projects and creative collaborations for better, more engaging renewable energy projects that people want to live with. We're a CIC with three directors and 20 or so people from other organisations uh, that are exploring a space where culture and energy meet. And we'd like to see local culture and energy groups collaborating more to find playful, hopeful, beautiful ways to inspire community activism. And on the right hand side of your image, um, you can see the very first of our solar panel artworks uh, that we produced in collaboration with uh, members of our collective. And uh, so these are the first of the projects that we developed. Um, here are some other examples of art and energy projects that we've been involved with. Um, lots of them developed in Plymouth, where we work with our partners, Plymouth Energy Community. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about our Moths to a Flame project, and we've got an introductory video if you decide that you want to share it with anyone. But in general, I want to tell you about the project we've developed with Plymouth Energy Community. This is a UK nationwide project where we're inviting people all across the UK to help us make 20,000 moths and record their messages for the Moths to a Flame installation at COP26, which is going to be installed in the Botanic Gardens um, in Glasgow. So what we're trying to do through this project is help people across the UK connect creatively with what's happening at COP. We're taking people's urgent calls for action on climate change to Glasgow. And given that we have energy as our focus, we would like to make those energy messages in particular. And we'd like us, the artwork in itself, to show that there is support and enthusiasm for a strong response to the climate emergency, despite the potential COVID restrictions and hopefully engaging people who might otherwise avoid marches and protests. Because as we've seen from Tom's um, last slide, there is a very strong level of support for action on climate change. So why are we using the moth as a metaphor? Um, we're using the moth to talk about our own relationship with energy and it invites us to consider energy in new ways. Um, it's an accessible thing that more and more people are doing to do moth watching. But um, many of you will already know that renewable energy installations have significant benefits for biodiversity. And it's um, something that uh, we find resonates with people when we talk about renewable energy projects. Also, moths are secret pollinators and their populations are in decline. So we've seen 30% reduction in moth populations in the UK since the 1960s. And some estimates put it at 80% reduction since the 1930s. So that's a bad situation for moths and, and will also land up being a bad situation for humans as well. And we've also seen research that shows that when people connect with nature, they're more likely to care for it and more likely to take action. Other aspects of our research are showing that creativity can relieve eco-anxiety that we're seeing increasingly and nurture positive attitudes towards green energy projects. So our ask is simple. Um, it's to watch moths 
to make moths for the installation and to record a message for COP26. And those moths and messages will form part of the installation. Um, because this project was developed in a COVID context, um, all of the resources that you need to participate are available online through our website. Um, and all of the support that we're giving is um, run on online um, live events. So we have short, concise, written and video instructions to help people join in, free printable templates and activities, sheets, a simple recording app, and um, weekly um, online events that people can join in with. So this is an example at Cockington Court of a moth to flame mini installation. Um, that's only got 300 moths. So if you can imagine a mega installation um, which incorporates sound at the Botanic Gardens, that may give you an impression of the um, size of the project that we're talking about. Now, um, we are inviting people also to pick and choose from a wealth of other resources to enjoy, which are for a range of ages and abilities. There's an augmented reality at, um, activity, which brings a colored in moth to life that can be shared on social media. There's a moths and energy poetry slam. There are challenges to help people become energy detectives in their local area, moths and energy activity packs. Um, uh, there are a number of solar artwork making sessions and there's a, a book called The Moth's Whisper which tells the story of Marnie the Moth who emerges from her pupa looking for the moon and she discovers the world of um, human use energy um, and that leads to a call to action to find new ways to generate our energy. So we're hoping to collaborate with community energy groups in particular across the UK inviting you to find a volunteer to deliver simple in-person sessions um, with, um, from which we'll support uh, with our team. And if you would like to become a Moths to Flame partner, um, the, in the, the first instance, it's very simple. You could just share details of the um, activities and resources with your networks. But if you are able to find a volunteer to run in-person moth making sessions, um, moth making sessions um, and record stuff locally. Um, we have a whole range of resources that can help. But the essential materials for making moths are very cheap or free and easy to get hold of because we've needed to make it possible for people who are stuck at home and isolating to still get involved. Um, but there are ways that you can get in, involved in a slightly more strong way. So it, we have a mega moth kit that can be used by schools or community groups that you can borrow or buy. And you can either build your own mini installation and enjoy it, and then we'll take the moths up to Glasgow, or you can just send us the moths straight away. So you can see on the right hand side, we've got suggested messages, a schedule of events, introductory videos, a number of templates, online training and support, uh, simple online resources, moth kits. There's digital partners badge, and we will be promoting um, online and via our blog um, all of the community energy stories that um, come through this process. And we will be provided a, an online digital installation of the exhibition. So here are some of our partners, our existing partners, and they include Glasgow Community Energy, um, Exeter Community Energy, um, we set South uh, East London Community Energy, and we're hoping with our partners in Plymouth Energy Community to reach groups all across the UK um, um, in the run up and the flight to Scotland across this year. Um, and if for some reason crop is delayed, the installation can be delayed, or we can um, still continue with it and um, present our digital form as well. So, I'm hoping that you can help us turn our many whispers of hope into a roar for change at this event. And uh, our next Schools and Partners Q&A is on the 18th of May. And here are our details of our website. So thank you. Lovely, thanks Chloe. And um, yeah, it's great, great to have that invitation for other organisations to get involved um, and, and build momentum through this creative uh, collaboration. 
Um, thanks very much. So next, moving swiftly on, is the Community Energy Soapbox, which is a new thing that we've introduced this time. Um, we wanted to give the opportunity for um, different organisations and, and people around the, the sector in the country to, uh, to, to speak to the particip participants here, um, tell, tell them something that's useful, interesting, new, um, and uh, bring it back at, at future events. Um, sort of don't forget that you can uh, request a little slot. So it's strictly two minutes. Um, so, John, if I could hand over to you, John Taylor from uh, the local Energy Hub, um, he'll be talking to us first um, about the Rural Community Energy Fund. And yeah, two minutes if you wouldn't mind, John. Thank you. Great. OK. Um, so, yes, uh, just a reminder to everybody that the Rural Community Energy Fund is still available for community energy groups in England to access. Um, you can get up to £40,000 for feasibility studies for community led rural energy schemes and also up to £100,000 as project development support costs for um, progressing a project through to investment stage. Um, so far, we've funded over, um, 18 projects in the Greater Southeast region, and the Energy Hub teams in the other regions have also had similar numbers coming through their own. We've actually only spent one third of our budget. We've still got um, £2 million in our Southeast budget available, so we could potentially support another 40 plus projects if um, the demand is there. And, I would say what better way to show Bayes and the Treasury that the community energy sector is serious about this than making sure all that money gets spent as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, you can apply through the energy hubs for that. Um, and there's, there's more stuff I wanted to mention um, about the international development side of COP26 as well. There is a work team involving Rescoop EU, Community Energy England, Energy for All and others looking at making more international partnerships um, as COP26 comes up and spreading that community energy model to other countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. We've also been in touch with community energy leaders in Australia, Japan, North and South America. So there is that whole angle um, to consider over the next few months as well. Oh, well, under two minutes. I love it. Thank you very much, John. Um, much appreciated. And, and a great invitation there again for yeah, groups in, in your region to um, take advantage of the funding on offer. Uh, next, we have Mike Andrews, who's going to talk to us about the cheese project over in Bristol. Um, so yeah, two minutes to you, Mike. Uh, over to you when you're ready. Hi there. Um, I'd like to screen share, if I may, because pictures, it goes better with pictures, this part. <laughs> Let's see, it might not let you, we'll have to just, oh no, that, that should, should be ready. work. Yeah. Um, have you got that full screen? I'm screen sharing, but is it full screen? Uh, it's not yet. No, oh, there we go. Yep, that's working. Great. Um, I'm going to have to rattle through these because I wasn't expecting uh, quite such a short pitch. Um, we make energy loss visible. And you can see that a cat loses most of its energy through its eyes, which might be a bit of a surprise to most people. And you lose energy from your home in surprising places too, like around your bath. And we do this very cheaply by using a thermal image camera, which plugs in the bottom of an iPhone. We've set up our own software and our own app, which works on the phone. Uh, we use a blower door to reduce the pressure indoors, and that's very cheap too. It's our own design, and um, we do the survey inside, not outside. And what it reveals in a nice new extension is a disaster. The cold air from the undercroft is shooting up, negating the heating from the underfloor heating. Here we've got a double glazed window, top right and it's been fitted so badly the hinges haven't been adjusted and it hasn't even been sealed into the brickwork. So you're losing all the benefit from the um, window through bad insulation. Here, um, cavity wall insulation has not reached the top of the bedroom and you can actually see the angle of repose of the beads on the picture. Um, the, as we're doing a survey, on our very cheap kit, the householders watch on a tablet because we've got Wi-Fi linking the two and they get engaged in the survey. We call this energy tracing and we give them the result on a memory stick. We don't write written reports. All of this keeps the cost down. 
We do our own training for free out of the community and you don't need prior qualifications. And we've won lots of awards, including one of yours, I'm glad to say, but an important one was the bottom left, Future Build, this was last year. We won the big innovation pitch and these were BRE judges and they realized that we were up something special. We lobby, here I am trying to persuade the head of the committee on climate change to take up the fact that we can make a difference. And we're starting a new company, have just started a new company because for the first time, having been working as volunteers for five years, we've got some money from Energy for Tomorrow and we're going to franchise our system um, that we've developed through the Cheese Project, which incidentally stands for Cold Homes Energy Efficiency Survey Experts. Now, the point of all of this is that if you have a thermal survey, you can target your remedial action. And for a hundred pounds draft busting, you can save a third of your energy use. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate the swiftness there, cutting that down. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, a great example of uh, an, an innovative organization in the sector who's leading on the energy efficiency side of which we have heard many nods today of how important that is um, within the broader context. Please get in touch with us if you want to, if you're interested in it in your area. Great, a great invitation there. Thank you, Mike. So again, moving swiftly on, we're gonna now um, move into some breakout sessions. So. Um, trying to consolidate all the many things that we've heard today about the, the COP side, the various opportunities um, in the sector, the need to engage with local authorities, um, how to uh, move the sector forward so it can demonstrate uh, what it's capable of, tell its stories, um, and yeah, anything else that you've heard today and want to talk about. So um, John has got some questions which are gonna go in the chat and hopefully they'll sort of be broadcast as well. So they'll kind of pop up on the screen when you're in the breakout rooms. The breakout rooms will be randomly assigned. Um, many of them will have a Community Energy England staff member or board member in. Um, so that will help um, with chairing uh, as long as those people are okay doing that. Um, and uh, if you don't have anyone from CEE in your um, breakout room, um, I hope that you, it will be okay just to um, kind of collaborate amongst yourselves to um, shape the conversation and respond to the questions. Um, obviously take it off in other directions uh, if that's what, what um, is of interest to you all. Um, so yeah, John will shortly press some sort of magic button that will um, send us all off into our rooms. Um, and is there anything else I need to say? Uh, nope, that should be it. Um, so we'll come back afterwards. Um, uh, we will adjust it slightly because we're slightly behind time. So it'll be a bit shorter than planned. And then we'll have a little session to um, report back if there's anything from the sessions, that, the breakout rooms that, that we want to share with the group. And we'll probably focus that on groups that didn't have a CE team member in because we'll be taking notes. Um, so the, the button's there. And if you join the breakout rooms now, you'll all be um, sent off to the relevant room. And yeah, a good, good point in the, the chat is that it's nice to put your cameras on if you can for the breakout rooms, just because it makes them a little more personal. Um, so see you all in various rooms in a moment. what you've all been learning about and thinking about today. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how many rooms there were, John might be able to fill me in, um, but I think probably in the interest of time, it's better if it's just voluntary. So if there's any, any representative of one of the breakout rooms that would like to feed back and make a particular point to reflect, probably best to keep it on the, on the topic of COP. So if you've got any points that were specifically about COP that you'd like to feed back from your room, um, then yeah, it'd be great great to hear them. So you can just open the floor, you, you, you're you able to unmute yourself and, and speak if you'd like to go ahead. Um, we've only got uh, five or 10 minutes to do that. So um, just keep it brief and share any thoughts that you might like to, thank you. Uh, Philip, I can, if that's helpful. Oh, right, yeah. Kick us off, yeah. thanks. Um, also, just to say that we've all, all the CE people have taken notes, so we will kind of feedback on, on any broader stuff, so don't feel under pressure to feedback if we're time committed and so on. Um, we had some really interesting talk around 
the balance between how we use COP as a comms hook and how we get our voice heard as a sector balanced with us actually being part of a much broader collective so that we're not competing with people, but we're actually being kind of part of that because we've such an urgent issue to be dealing with at the moment, well, forever probably around climate change. Um, and then really, the, the difference of the type of activities and the importance between the run up to COP and at COP. And some of the things we talked about was around um, how engaging with schools, um, idea of town twinning. So um, whether we can twin UK community energy groups with international community energy groups, the importance of engaging non-traditional partners. So Chloe's talk about really um, uh, exciting bid that she's got in with the um, Arts Council, which we'll share about if she's successful um, around how we how we partner with cultural partners to around art and so on to really demonstrate the importance of community energy. Um, and also, if anyone knows the answer to this, but if not, I'll look it up. Um, if there are, if there is a counter conference being arranged this year at Glasgow, because Richard mentioned that he went to Paris in 2015, and actually the counter conference was probably more engaging and exciting than the actual main conference. So there might be an opportunity for us to engage through that as well. So that's my quick feedback. Thanks, Emma. Would anybody like to follow Emma with some more thoughts? I can feed back about our group where we talked about, um, particularly about local authorities, um, that was partly due to the participants that we had, but um, talking about the, the particularly engaging people and how to make um, the COP year kind of meaningful and the work that might go into to trying to tell stories and engage people about community energy being sort of meaningful in the context of COP, um, but also then how to um, engage new people in the sector and, and that, that COP's a big opportunity um, to, to do that. And we've kind of thinking about different ways with working with schools or um, trying to present the, the opportunity to, to new organisations to, to work with community energy and sort of take up the offer that the sector to gives. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's some enthusiasm, but it's, it's just great to hear that the, the thoughts in when all different, different kinds of organisations, both uh, with community energy organisations and the sector practitioners, but also local authorities and the, uh, the sort of some other partners and service providers like the new unity um sort of really yeah engaging with the opportunity um to tell tell stories and, and, and build momentum in the sector um yeah we, go ahead uh, we, we spent quite a lot of time talking about um gaining trust with uh, local authorities in relation to community energy groups and of course there's actually a connection between cop because because what we're aiming to do in northeast Hampshire is to have some sort of local COP type event uh, which the community groups are uh, heavily engaged in but also with our local politicians as well and our MP so it is a way to if you like level up the playing field between the community groups and local authorities as we look at the big issues so that's what we're hoping to do it hasn't, hasn't got hasn't uh, happened yet and hopefully it will be planned Great, thank you, John. Debbie, I see your hand up. Well, our group went wonderfully off piste and we talked a lot about how you actually engage your community. Um, and we talked a lot about people who might be fearful or have head in a paper bag or any of the rest of it about what's happening. And there were some lovely inputs. Uh, we very much like the input of, of Natalie and of Beth in terms of different channels to get the message out because one of the big things was community energy really has to get its marketing message stronger. Um, but then uh, we also had brilliant comment about make it easy for people to engage, uh, make it easy for people to buy community um, generated energy. We talked a lot about how we how young people who might not have a lot of spare money or spare time could get engaged. And then two wonderful um, examples about if you want to get engagement in your community, do something controversial. And we had two wonderful examples. One was a turbine right next to a school, which has gone from ooh, controversial to absolutely brilliant and part of the curriculum is now looking at sustainability and things like that. So it started off controversial, but ended up very positive. Money also going, some money going to the school. And the other thing was one of the Unity winners of an award 
is also going to put a, 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 a wind turbine up in their small village. They know it will create a lot of conversation and that will bring people in. So it's all around how you actually get that wider inclusion in with people who might not necessarily be that interested in energy, but are interested in their community. And then they can all bring it in and all go forward together. It, it, to my team, have I captured everything that was said? Because a lot of really good stuff came out. Some nods there. Thanks, Debbie. Um, great. Well, unless there's last hand up, which I can't can't see any, um, I'll draw us to a close. Um, on sort of picking up from where Debbie left off, I'm just going to do a little trumpet for Community Energy England because um, based on what Debbie said, if there's ways that you're engaging your community, if there's ways you've engaged your local authority, um, if there's successes that you've had or tools you've created, um, that's what we're here to do is share those with other organisations. As you know, Community Energy is distributed, it's small, it's volunteer led, um, and uh, the work that the hard work that gets put in one region is often kept within that little space. And so what we want to, to try and help the sector do is to share that and spread it out. So particularly as COP year is here, um, we've heard about it being a huge kind of opportunity to tell stories about the sector, to engage new people, to um, to, to do something new and, and to push the sector forward. But uh, what we think underpins that is, is helping each other. So um, that's what we want to try and facilitate. And so, yeah, if you've got um, tools, resources, if you've got business models, things new, new uh, things that you've created, um, just, yeah, send them our way and we'll help to share them around so that other people can benefit from them. And hopefully we can help the sector um, just move forward together uh, and, and grow faster. So, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, Debbie's got a hand up, go for it. A quick one, I left out one a really, really good suggestion from Kate, who said, if we want people not to run away about this huge existential crisis running towards us, then what we need to do is marry it with humour. And she has suggested we all look at sustainer babble. Podcast, that is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, good tip. Alex, have you got your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, we, ref we reflected on using COP26 as a platform to influence government policy, but with to amplify our messages around all the different projects and, and initiatives that we're doing. And then the last tongue-in-cheek shout out for Glasgow Community Energy, who will be having their AGM during the time of COP26. Nice of them to line that up together. Um, so really what we should all do is help promote and amplify that as a working example of one of 300 groups doing similar things around the UK and the impact of that. So maybe we could like mass pile, pile around uh, Glasgow Community Energy's gaff and give them a shout out and, you know, kick down on their front room floor like students, stuff like that. Quite fun. And yeah, the fringe events are always loads better. Great. Yeah, it will be brilliant to see all this momentum building as the sector um, kind of piles in and pitches in. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming. I um, really appreciate you uh, both attending and taking part. Um, conversations um, hopefully have started today that will continue long after uh, we've shut the Zoom down. Um, and, yeah, we, we just hope that you've been a little bit inspired and a little bit um, challenged in terms of what COP means for the sector. Um, we've heard about it as, yeah, a year to showcase the sector, what we can offer government to drive behaviour change, energy system transition, um, the, 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 the need to engage central government from the perspective of delivering the targets that they've set um, as well as working with local authorities to try to take concrete action on the ground that will improve people's lives and, and, and change the, the local energy system. Um, we are aware that that comes with both challenges and opportunities. Um, at Community Energy England we are all about challenges and opportunities. Um, we want to hear about what you're doing, your successes. We want to hear about the obstacles that are in your way. You'll have seen that we've just closed the state of the sector survey. And that's one of the things that we do to try to gather that information in, but we're always here and, and want to talk to you. We love to hear your news. Um, yeah, we love to hear your successes and the, the things that are stopping you and do the things that you want to do. As uh, members, um, we uh, love to share your news around. So um, that's that's kind of one way that we can broadcast. Um, we've got our how-to pages on our website um, that are our way of sharing um, some tools and resources with you. Um, and 
one of the things that I would just say is if you have been on this call and this meeting and you've thought, oh, sounds good, sounds interesting, community in England, what are they all about? Well, we would love you to join us. If you are engaged in the sector, if you supporter of community energy, if you want to help the sector grow, then yeah, adding your voice to ours um, is really important. Um, it's free if you're just starting out as an organisation in the sector. Um, we do ask for small financial contribution if you grow larger and have a higher income. Um, but yeah, please get in touch with us to join. It's a simple form on the website. And um, yeah, the more that we can say that we represent the whole sector, the stronger our voice will be. So please do add yours to it. Um, we've got social media channels, so um, follow them as usual, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, all of those kinds of things. Um, the next thing that we've got coming up is Community Energy Fortnight. Um, that's 14th to the 27th of June. And so building on some of the things that you've heard today, the inspiration, the challenges, um, do think about how you can get involved in the fortnight. So that's a, a real sort of public broadcast event. It's a sort of how can we loop everyone in, try to spread the message as wide as possible. So uh, we hope that COP will be a big feature of the fortnight in terms of uh, trying to sort of connect the two up, connect, connect the sector and what it's capable of and what it's doing up with the future, the COP, the, the opportunities that presents, as well as where we go beyond that in terms of the growth of the sector. So yeah, consider speaking to your MP, planning an event, filming a short film, something that you can do to get involved in with during the fortnight. And of course, tell us about it so that we can uh, broadcast that more widely. So until next time, there'll also be another conference coming up. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you again to all the panelists. Thank you to the Community Engine and team for support and, and getting the event together. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Great, thank you. Very good.